and how each sends an underlying message about their values and interests. Royal style is singular in its power and its purpose. Certainly before this generation, royal women didn't tend to speak. For the most part, their job is to appear. Those images are spread around the world in seconds, and before you know what a royal woman is doing, or where she's going, or what cause she's supporting, you see what she's wearing. The thing about Queen Elizabeth is that I don't know that she was interested in fashion, but she understood the power of clothes and the role of clothes in her royal duties. She developed this wardrobe that she was sort of known for, right? A working wardrobe of colorful styles, but it was fashion too because she played with colors, she played with textures, she played with different embellishments on her hat, and it turned her into this like brightly colored, delightful grandma figure. Queen Elizabeth set the stage for royal fashion and she made it something that people paid attention to. What Diana did was make royal fashion exciting. She embraced trends in a way that the queen never did. One of my favorite quotes too is from a photographer who said, we didn't even care about the engagement, we just showed up to see what Diana was wearing. And that was the power of it. And Diana hit the stage at the time that the modern media landscape was exploding. So there were glossy fashion magazines, all of a sudden they needed to fill their pages. And here was this beautiful, statuesque, blonde princess who was wearing all this exciting fashion and I think what was so special about Diana is that she enjoyed fashion you could tell so Kate entered the scene and I think she made royal fashion accessible and relatable in a way from what I understand Kate was not necessarily super into fashion but I think she is now and <laughs> I think you can tell by the spirit of some of what she wears after she had Prince Louis, she sort of stepped back onto the scene in this really exciting way that to me suggests she has really embraced fashion and is having fun with fashion. There's one dress, it was a shirt dress, and it had a slight slit. And I feel like the old Kate would have sewn up that slit a little bit. She kept it open. And you just saw enough of her leg that everyone was like, whoa, what's happening here? And she looked fabulous. And it only works because what we had come to expect from Kate was so sort of traditional and classic and safe. And so suddenly when she has those moments, it's, I think it's very exciting. Meghan really shook up the royal fashion conversation in a really welcome way. I think she understood better than anyone the power of clothing, the attention of clothing, the language of clothing, because she had worked on a set with a costume designer that's their whole game is to speak through clothes. And what she did, it sounds so silly in hindsight, but it, she modernized it by wearing things like trousers, which is something that every modern woman everywhere wears pants, right? But because Meghan was wearing suddenly like a black suit, you're like, wait, that's not what we usually see from royal fashion. And people who did not um, sort of see themselves in Kate's style, I think perhaps saw themselves in Meghan's. And so what she did was she took the royal fashion audience and made it much bigger. When royals tour around the world, they use their fashion as sartorial diplomacy, as sort of soft power, and to speak in a way that you don't have to use a voice. And I think there's such power in that, and it takes a lot of work. Back in the Queen's Day and then Diana's Day, there would be a whole team that would go and scope out other locations and they would pick out outfits based on the background. And they would study the colors of a country's flag, they would study the country's flowers. One of my favorite pictures of the Queen is when she came to California in 1983. She went to a dinner in a gown covered in California poppies. And you think, wow, somebody somewhere was like, California, the state flower is the poppy, we need a dress. And then they made this beautiful dress that speaks specifically to California. Royal women are also very cognizant of how much to incorporate local dress into what they're wearing. And the queen was really careful with this because you don't want it to look costumey, but you definitely want to look as though you are aware of what people are wearing and dress accordingly. And we saw that brilliantly with Kate in Pakistan. She turned to local designers, she wore local dress. If you see here, she's wearing the color of the uniform of the kids. Can you even believe that? And you know, the day before she was wearing the colors of the Pakistani flag. I think it's just beautiful. 
So dressing for the slideshow is a term I came up with on Instagram because it's a nod to the slideshows that fashion websites like to compile, but it's thinking about not just a single look on its own, but a sequence or a cadence of looks. Kate has stepped out for Trooping the Color in a bright green design, and then a couple days later at Garter Day, she wore white, and then at Royal Ascot, she wore red. And you think, oh, red is like a very bold color, and you know, for Ascot in the past, she's worn softer pastel. So why would she be wearing red? But it's because the green, white, and red together make up the colors of the Welsh flag. And for her first time doing all these engagements as the Princess of Wales, I thought that was a really lovely nod. Royal fashion has changed in a number of ways. I think first and foremost, it's changed because it is now shoppable in a way that it never used to be. When Queen Elizabeth was a young queen, she wore a few off the rack pieces, but mostly it was bespoke. It was custom for her. And so you could sort of admire royal fashion without taking part in it. By the time Catherine became the Duchess of Cambridge, suddenly e-commerce made it possible to shop what she was wearing. And then you could feel like you were having a part of it in a really sort of special way. So repeating outfits is a big part of the royal fashion conversation. I think repeating fashion is a sign that these are working wardrobes, that these are pieces that they invest in. And so there'll be headlines like, Kate's worn this co coat four times. And it's like, well, every woman has a coat in her closet that she's worn like 40 times, probably, hopefully. But it makes them seem, I think, more human in a really helpful way. In this moment, the Princess of Wales is the one to watch. She joined the royal family over a decade ago. Since then, her style choices have changed the conversation. And what is known as the Kate Effect began. Molly Hunter has more. The Princess of Wales has been called a fashion inspiration, icon and influencer. She's simple but elegant, understated but regal, accessible but elevated. The princess is renowned for her powerful impact on fashion, known as the Kate Effect. The shopping stampede began with the blue Issa dress that Kate wore for her engagement announcement in 2010, which sold out in 24 hours. The trend continued with the Reese dress she wore to meet the Obamas at Buckingham Palace in 2014, and unprecedented demand for that dress caused Reese's website to crash, and sales for British shoe designer Camilla Elphick went off the scale, one style selling out after Kate was spotted wearing them. Her choices are even credited with giving a boost to the economy. It has been said that Kate has a billion dollar effect on the British economy, and that's because she has really helped to promote not only British luxury brands, but brands across the world. While the princess's love is known for British designers like Jenny Packham and Alexander McQueen, responsible for her wedding dress, red carpet stunners, and powerhouse suits, she also frequents more accessible brands like Barber and LK Bennett. She mixes luxury looks with affordable accessories, like this Alexander McQueen gown paired with Zara earrings. And although she's next in line to be queen, Kate is not above recycling some of her beloved looks, serving as a model of sustainable fashion. She balances between the glamorous and down to earth, giving people around the globe access to her look. In 2016, Kate appeared on the cover of British Vogue's 100th anniversary issue, surprising everyone with her casual look, jeans in the countryside. Another reason we love Kate's style, the similarities to that of her mother-in-law, Princess Diana, the previous Princess of Wales. For the royal family, what one wears to an event is almost as important as the occasion itself. And from coronations to royal affairs, we can always count on Kate to deliver a show-stopping look. Even her husband, Prince William, agrees. And the legacy extends to the next generation. There's growing interest in the clothing that her children are sporting. As the princess's role continues to evolve, so does her style, and we'll be watching the future queen and her style evolution every step of the way. We can't wait to see what Kate wears next. After the break, Princess Diana in the spotlight. We revisit some of her most iconic looks. Plus, Meghan Markle fashion contributor? We look back at her time at Today, sharing the best looks for the summer. Stay with us.
welcome back to the Royal Rundown. We now step into the shoes of the late Princess Diana, who knew the power of fashion. Many of her outfits still popular today. E! News' Erin Lim Rhodes has more. Take a look. Princess Diana's fashion legacy continues to reign supreme. There's no doubt that the royal left her mark on the world, redefining the role of a princess and shaping pop culture. She also cemented herself as a style icon with coveted looks that have stood the test of time. From chic athleisure to that jaw-dropping revenge dress, here's a look at Princess Diana's fashion moments that we're still obsessed with. And now more on Princess Diana with a look back at her iconic style thanks to an exclusive exhibit held just down the street at Kensington Palace. I got the chance to tour the exhibit back in 2017 and let me tell you, seeing some of her wardrobe in real life as they say is something I will never forget. Princess Diana, the most famous and photographed woman in the world. She balanced really well the whole idea of capturing press attention, really speaking loudly through her clothes to absolutely enormous audiences. Diana, her fashion story, celebrates her style with 25 dresses. It charts her fashion journey from shy teenager to international icon. It includes the dress she wore to the White House dancing with John Travolta to the dress she wore on the cover of Harper's Bazaar. There's a dress that people will remember because of what happened when she was wearing it. She famously danced in the White House with John Travolta wow. and it was one of those amazing moments. Said Cyrus, along with his wife Catherine Walker, designed many of the dresses in this exhibit. Wherever she went, people wanted to see her as a British princess. She was, after all, the future queen. Uh, a British ambassador. These were, after all, work clothes. The Versailles Palace was the inspiration for this dress the Princess wore in 1994. But what did strike me was the way in which the light came through. What we designed was something which we felt would show the Princess shining through a frame. This is a really poignant one. Also on display, some of her favourite dresses she auctioned off for charity just two months before her death. Like this Versace dress, worn just after she separated from the Prince of Wales. She's saying, I, I've separated, I'm my own person. She was asserting her independence, but she was also, I think, by this point, had really solidified and understood and stamped her own style. The garments that we see here are testament to, um, to her legacy in many ways. These these garments then became mementos of the princess. What legacy did she leave for the fashion world? The princess is hugely relevant. On a personal level, so many people all around the world somehow still see a piece of themselves in the princess. A voice that was silenced way too early. While that exhibit is now closed, Kensington Palace's largest exhibit ever Crown to Couture is currently open to the public until October. Coming up, diamonds, rubies, emeralds. Oh my, our very own Savannah Guthrie got a chance to try on all the royal jewels earlier this year. Plus, royal fashion on a budget, the social media influencer who recreates Kate's looks for everyday wear after the break.
Welcome back. The fascination with royal attire is not just about the clothes. Remember, we are talking about queens and princesses here, and everyone has a royal crown. Oh, many crowns. Well, our very own Savannah Guthrie wanted in on the action. Watch as she gets a taste of what royal jewels shopping is all about. Royals and fashion go hand in hand. Throughout the ages, royals have been style influencers and trendsetters. These days, Catherine, the Princess of Wales, wears that crown. But every time she wears a new outfit, it immediately sells out. For royals, what one wears to an event is almost as important as the occasion itself. Hats are a must for royal races. Then there are the royal weddings, the annual Trooping the Colour, state banquets and the opening of Parliament, crowns, tiaras and jewels. For the King and Queen's coronation, the crown jewels take centre stage. Important pieces for the big day include the Imperial State Crown and the Royal Scepter with a Cross, all made or modified by Garrod, who reigned for 164 years as the first official crown jeweler. Wow! <laughs> I feel well, royal already. <laughs> this room was actually named um, after Queen Mary with her kind permission. It's Queen Mary would come here. Yes. Well, so you've had a lot of royalty over the years. Yes, we have. So on Coronation Day, we will see jewels that were designed here. Yes. Tell me about them. Okay, so we have, um, we actually have an um, original artwork here of Queen Mary's Consort Crown. So that was designed and made um, by Garage for Queen Mary in 1911. And Queen Consort Camilla is going to actually she is. wear she, this, this is crown. The crown that she's going to be wearing. What about the Imperial Crown? So the Imperial State Crown, that was remade totally by Garage in 1937. Well, I feel very bedazzled <laughs> here. So you're looking at some replicas of um, tiaras, historical tiaras that Garrett had made. Can we look at them? Yes. Oh, yeah, of course we can. Let me just see. Oh, what do we think? Perfect on you. <laughs> you have the perfect hair for a tiara. Oh, good. I'm so glad. That's how <laughs> I've just been going my whole life waiting for the right tiara. <laughs> There's also another iconic creation to their credit. You're, you're sporting some beautiful bling as well, and I feel like I've seen this before. A beautiful example of this is uh, Princess of Wales' engagement ring, um, which was formerly worn by the previous Princess of Wales, Diana. Hers is obviously a little bit larger than this one. But <laughs> this is pretty large. But this one's pretty, pretty special this as well. This will do. <laughs> Someone who has worn many royal jewels over the last few years, Meghan Markle. As a working royal, the Duchess of Sussex dazzled with her fashion-forward looks. But before she joined this family, she was a member of the Today Show family, a Today Show contributor, giving her take on the up and coming fashion trends. Can you believe it? Here's a look back at one of her segments from 2015, a year before she even started dating Prince Harry. Meghan Markle is back. She plays the always fashionable Rachel Zane on USA's hit series Suits, but she's multi-talented. She also runs her own fashion and lifestyle website called The Tig. Meghan, good morning. Good, good to see morning. you. Good to see you too. We've got four great trends yes. and we're going to show how the celebrities wear them and then how the rest of us can wear Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And they're all pretty easy to pepper into your wardrobe, so it should be fun. Okay, so the first one is matching print Tops and bottoms, we've seen this on Taylor Swift, Michelle yes. Obama, Carrie Washington. What's the key to wearing the trend? Oh, it's fantastic. And it's actually really doable, right? So you want to look at matching prints, and they can be subtle. So you can see as you here has the vertical print on the bottom, horizontal up top. And then you keep it really edgy, fresh, and modern with like a nice structured sandal. But it's simple to pepper in. And then a little sliver of skin. I don't know. If you want to do it, you can certainly uh, dare to bear just a touch. Well, Yasmin looks great. You don't have to have the crop top to do this look. You you definitely don't have to. Now, everyone from Gap to Chanel is doing this sort of look, and she pulls it off so well, but you don't have to. You can just have one fluid silhouette with the matching pieces, and I think you'll look really on trend. They're it's not matchy-matchy, though. They complement each other, but exactly. this horizontal versus vertical, is that the key? Yes, and so it's subtle, right? And it's an easy way to keep it looking really on trend and comfortable, too, right? Yeah. I think we can all put something in our wardrobe like that and, and look great at any summer barbecue. Yeah. The Yasmin looks beautiful. Yay. Thank you. Our next trend is white on white. Let's bring our model out. This is Heidi. We've seen this on Julianne Hough, Lupita yep. Nyong'o, Kim Kardashian West, head to toe white. It's so pretty. 
best for summer. I love it. It's just effortlessly chic. And the way to do this really is you want to play with little subtle accents, right? You can see she has a great crisp white button down and then adds texture with the skirt that has a sort of see-through element and a pop of color with her clutch, simple gold bangles. I love this look. It's and the round sunglasses, is that the new shape we're supposed to be wearing? It is such a shape. It is the most on-trend thing. And they're like easy and cool and also sort of a nod to the 70s vibe, which we'll see in one of the other looks coming up. I love it. Heidi, thank you so much. Our next trend is gingham. Now, all summer long, we see the guys in this here around the Today Show, but ladies <laughs> yes. love it too. Reese Witherspoon, Dakota Johnson, yes. Victoria Justice, and now our model Peyton. Well, so that's the thing. I mean, you would see gingham in menswear for as long as you can remember. And now, remember how plaid in the fall was such a trend? Yeah. So this is going to be your summer plaid, so to speak. It's easy. You can wear it as a skirt or a dress, as she's doing, but you could also just have a great button-down tucked into a pencil skirt or some some shorts and you're perfect for summer. It's um, it is not Dorothy from Wizard of Oz. No. It is much shaker these days. When we come back, TikToker Morgan Irwin shares her secrets for dressing just like Kate Middleton in a few inspired looks. Welcome back. The royal family's fashion has inspired trends around the world for decades. But for one viral TikToker outside Baton Rouge, Louisiana, more than 4,600 miles from the palace here in London, it's the timelessness of Kate, Princess of Wales's fashion choices that draws her in. And she's gained her own royal size audience, showing women everywhere how to dress like a princess without having access to the privy purse. Here's Molly Hunter with more. Welcome to a series that I like to call Kate Middleton style on an Amazon budget. I don't know if y'all are the same, but I am obsessed with her. Social media style maven Morgan Freeman has always been drawn to the grace and elegance of the Princess of Wales. I vividly remember when they got engaged and she was wearing that navy blue dress. And I was 12 at the time. That's where it just like clicked for me. I was like, I have to dress like this woman. I want to carry myself like her. But it probably wasn't until these past two years that I got to the age where I was like, you know what, this is what I love. And now Kate's influence continues on one of the biggest days of Morgan's life. I'm getting married in September and I bought the first wedding dress that I tried on because I had a very distinct vision in my mind, um, Kate's wedding dress. Her love for Kate's style has ignited Morgan's own fashion following. I love it. I am actually so in love with this. With over 3 million likes on TikTok, where she reimagines the royal styles for less. I cannot get over this $29 dress. There are girls that are on the younger side that don't want to follow fast trends. Then there's women that are 60, 70 years old and they're like, thank you so much, you've saved my wardrobe. And I feel like I've created this really warm environment for women. I don't think y'all are ready for this. Star of the show, this maroon coat with the faux fur. I'm speechless. Let's put it on. The most viral look is definitely the maroon coat. It's a timeless piece that I feel like people can pull out around the holidays when it's cold year after year. 
when Kate comes out, it's like, I'm just waiting to see what she's wearing because I'm hopping on my phone to see if I can find something similar while saving people money. Her secret to creating a high-end royal look for less, it's pay attention to the details. Say a stripe doesn't align at the seam, to me that is like a big no-no. It just doesn't look cohesive. It doesn't look expensive. Um, another thing is like hardware and buttons on clothing. Even if it's a good silhouette, if there's a cheap button or a cheap zipper, I'm like staying away from that. I spend time, time, time digging. I've <laughs> regrettably spent probably hours of the night until 3 a.m. like scouring and like, I know I can find trousers that look just like hers. I only share if I feel 100% confident, like this is a good outfit to put into the world because I want people to be happy with what they're getting and feel good in that clothing. But it isn't just the princess's wardrobe that this royal watcher is drawn to. Kate embodies is kind of like a poised power. So I feel like through her clothing, but then also just her, her energy, it's like this lady seems so delicate and like royal, but at the same time, like so strong and bold. Morgan's crowning achievement, helping other women feel confident with wardrobes that may never go out of style. It like sparks this like childlike joy in me to put an outfit together. I love to feel that for myself, to feel so good in an outfit when you walk out the door, like, oh my gosh, like I feel like I'm on cloud nine right now because my outfit is so like banging. But doing that for other people is like tenfold. And there you have it, your primer on royal style. I hope we've answered all of your questions and you've learned a little something about how each fashion choice does more than meets the eye. We can't wait to see what the royal family wears next and we'll be following every step of the way. Thank you for joining me this half hour. I'm Keir Simmons. See you next time on Today or Day. When it's as hot as it's been this summer, the last thing you want to do is turn on an oven. Okay, here's the question. When was the last time you turned on your oven? It's been a while. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> so, we've got you a cool summer treat thanks to one of our favorites, Chef, Chef Alex Guanaschelli. She's the host of Food Network's Alex versus America. This woman can take on the entire Country. country. Okay, and by the way, this month she'll be feeding hungry tennis fans at the U.S. Open and her yeah. restaurant fair. I'm going to come. Yeah, it's the perfect restaurant. It's open for 12 days, and then it closes. It's ideal, and it's super fun. The U.S. Open Ugh. is just the place oh, to be. Oh, I can't wait. It's, I'm going with you. Oh, and I'm sorry. Oh. I'm just kidding. You can come <laughs> with me. Okay, tell us about this no-bake pie. We love it. You don't have to put it in the oven. No, you literally just layer stuff that's delicious. Now, we've got a homemade, uh, we've got a store-bought a graham cracker crust. Like you that. could use, you could make it homemade. Butter, no, graham no, crackers. No. Okay, good talk. You're going <laughs> to put a little bit of ground cinnamon and salt on the crust itself. Wow. on the crust. To give it a little extra flavor, Ooh, I right? I love this. Right? We're layering Ooh. the flavors in there. And then I have some peanut butter here. Okay. Mm. And I used crunchy. Now I you, like crunchy for now, some little texture, right? You do I you like, like a crunch. So. I do like crunch. Are you a smooth? I, you know what? A crunch in here. You know, I like a crunchy ice cream, a crunchy um, peanut butter on vanilla ice cream, which is what you're giving us. Yes. Yeah, so crunchy peanut butter. I added a little water. I saw just that. To, just to loosen the texture a little bit, because that's what we, that's what we like to do because around here. Because we need here. to smooth it. Yeah, we're smoothing. Do you want to smooth it? Smooth. Smooth. Yeah. I love it how you're like, please smooth. I know. We're now, a good team. Now, when, look at that. Look at this. You well, are. the cinnamon. Uh, no, oh, but boy. I, I can't. Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, uh, yep. All right. Talk. All right. I'm pretty. I'm pretty. I'm pretty. I'm so pretty. Here we okay. Are. okay. You look good. Look. So you put the layer of peanut butter in the freezer, right, to get it a little Frozen. firmed up. And then we put softened vanilla ice cream on so top here. So how soft does this need to be? It, it's, uh, you see how it's yeah, almost, almost liquidy? Melted. So you can leave it out while you're doing the other layers. And I mean, this, is, this. this is a so peanut butter fun. s'more vibe that we're going for. And then we sprinkle marshmallows on top. How fun is this? This is and amazing. And you can do this with the kids. A little brown sugar. By the way, brown sugar. I don't even yeah, know. I don't even know if the little... marshmallows would make it there because I would eat all of them. I know you are actually you're talking with a marshmallow in the most mm -hmm. brilliant way. Mm -hmm. Okay, we freeze that 
for a while. We let that firm up, and then what? Yeah, yeah. We're adding chocolate on top of this. Yeah, okay, and this then you do that. Now we add chocolate ice cream okay. on top there, and again, it's smooth. Yes. And by the way, you can do just vanilla or yeah. just chocolate. Oh, you can kind of sort of choose yes, what you want. Yes, absolutely. You can make this oh. easier and or use harder. Any type of ice cream, frankly. And, yeah, and then we we do a little more. We do some chocolate again. You notice we're always adding a little crunch, a little texture. Yes. We yes. didn't turn on our oven, but we're turning on the charm here. You sure are, just by being you, Alex. And then some like marshmallows. Like someone who cooks without a measuring cup. That's what I love about you. There's yes. no measuring. It's I love just it. Go do you ever it. use a measuring cup? Yeah. I really actually do, but in a case like this, uh, it's like, I mean, oh, there was too much measuring? chocolate. Yeah. There was too much whipped cream. I hated it. <laughs> That's not going to happen. And then we layer that that whipped cream on top, and you can put this right back in the freezer. And you know what? And I, and I wonder if you agree. I think it's worth whipping your own cream. You know what? I do, and I like to use unsweetened so that it kind of yeah, counters all the sweetness. And I see what you want to put on top, which is some sea salt. Yes, so and then more chocolate. I like to whip my own cream. Yeah, and you know what? You Please did don't it. be nasty. Sure, Jan. You Please did it. Don't you Jan. did it. Turn on the oven. You can whip your own cream, and then you have this all on top, and you pop it in the freezer, and then oh my God, look! It's oh magically too. I got this for you for your birthday. Thank you so Happy much. birthday! You better give me more than a pie. <laughs> I will. Don't worry. Thanks. This is amazing. The peanut butter is delicious. I love it. Alex, we love you, and you can get these recipes at today.com/food. Okay, if you're throwing a backyard barbecue this weekend, we've got a dessert you've got to try. It is an ice cold. No bake berry cream. Oh my gosh, pie. you had us at no bake. And you know it's good because Padma Lakshmi is here. She's making it. She's the host and executive producer of Bravo's <laughs> hit cooking competition series, Top Chef, which has been nominated for and you five have been nominated choice Amazing. awards. And yes, and the finale is tonight, so please watch. All the way, congratulations. Um, thank it must you. feel so good after this many seasons to still have that rush. It does. It feels yeah. good. And mm -hmm. also Taste the Nation, my mm -hmm. other show, got nominated for a couple of Critics' Choice wow. Awards, too. So it's All right, really let's get, we, we got let's you get some champagne to celebrate the queen. Yay! Okay, so talk to us, Padma, okay, about so this. Okay, so today I'm going to teach you how to make a really, really easy cheers, cheers. Mm -hmm. um, mm. recipe for berry pie. Mm -hmm. Jenna, I want you to just crush these okay. up. Okay. All you do is you take about a cup and a half, which is usually one of those packets of graham yep. cracker, yep. and you... Mm. This is Make them into yeah. crumbs like right. she's doing. Love it. Add some cubed butter, about oh. six tablespoons. And how melty should that be? It shouldn't be that melty. It's just, just been room sitting temp. out. Yeah. Because okay. you guys were joking with Michelle, who I love. She's like, hilarious. Really. She's so so you want to mix this. The easiest way your is with your fingers, okay. to be honest. And you want to get it to look like that. Crumbly. Then I'll you just, just dump, it dump it all in. You don't have oh, to be so precious. And here precious. too, you're gonna pat. <laughs> Nobody's this. ever called her that before. In that dress, you look very precious. And you just want to smash this down yeah. to make it as flat as possible. Okay. And that's your graham cracker and, crust. And by the way, this. you can buy this too, but you Yes. Know. But do you? I do sometimes. Okay, cool. I do. Okay. When I'm on, like, the summer. Yeah. Like, summer you don't want to cook. No. And I'm not a big baker, so that's yes, why that's I love this cool. dessert. This is uh, vanilla ice cream that um, you're just leaving out. Yeah. And all you're going to do. This I mean, is so we simple. can do this. Oh, my God. Yes, look at this. You don't do you want this. it? Yes, oh. I can do this. And then all you do here is just smooth this out. You can use an offset spatula. How long did you leave that out for? Like Probably 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Not even 30. Because okay. you don't want it to be so, melty. Too yeah. mushy. So that goes on there. And you, then you put the berries on. But come it. here. Let's go over here. Oh, we're making minis. Yeah, okay. we're making minis. So These you guys, are cute for kids. I think oh, we yeah. should do this. Now, and the one tip it. I want to tell you, I know that in you know June is eating healthy right. month. So this oh, is, is done with ice cream. But when I do it at home, yeah. I do it with vanilla yogurt. Yeah. Okay. Or better yet, I do it with lassi, which is Indian drinkable yogurt. Wow. Drinkable? And I want to talk oh. about this because it is healthy. Yeah. Uh, Indian yogurt is cultured a different way. A billion and four, 1.4 billion people can't be wrong. Yeah. yeah. Like it's an ancient, ancient practice. Do you freeze it too? Can you, you can freeze it? You can freeze it and I use it in this berry pie. It has 15, uh, the brand that I like is The Delicious. I liked it so much I became an investor in this company. Amazing. It has 15 billion probiotics. Wow. It, it has the lowest sugar of any drinkable yogurt and it's delicious. The reason I became involved in it is because they sent me some stuff and as you can imagine, I get so much stuff sent yeah. 
yeah. me. Sure. I just put it in the fridge. My daughter and my nephews kept reaching for it. It was Brown gone beer. before I could try it the first round. Oh my they gosh. Sent it to me. Wow. And I was like, why is this so good? Because yeah. it tastes so decadent. It's just really good. Does it good. taste so decadent? It does. I dare you to. Uh, we'll okay, send, send you some. Yeah. I would let's love taste to. this while we're here. Oh, yes. Yes. Can we? Yes, please. Okay. please and do. I feel like you can use any type of ice cream for you this, can, too, right? Like flavor. strawberry? And the one thing I want to mm -hmm. tell you, yeah, you can. The one thing I want to tell you, if you're serving this, mm. you just need to freeze mm. it for eight hours mm. and then slice it. And then any pie you have left mm. over, put it back in the freezer mm. right away because it will melt. But this feels like an elegant dessert, but it's really just and ice easy cream. To serve. It's easy, and I frankly, you could just buy the crust, and it will take one second. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've just you, you've Thank just you. given us Thanks, our Padma. idea for this mm. recipe. Go today dot com slash food. <laughs>
flecks as opposed to flakes. I'm going to put it right into my crust. Mm -hmm. This, this is, is so so good. Oh my god, I love this you guys orange, you so can really much. Taste the orange. All right, we got I am one going minute to... left, wow. and I want to get okay. to go. Okay, let's go. This is going in the into the freezer. freezer. Okay. Perfect. Freezer. Here we go. Got also, it. just have to say, this is special whipped cream with melted marshmallows or fluff in it because it stabilizes the cream and it gives it great flavor. We're making Dylan's birthday cake. In here, we have flour, sugar, we have leavening, we have salt. We are adding some sprinkles. Next. Oh, and this cake is vegan, by the way. Really? This is a rainbow sprinkle birthday cake. The dressing as well? I mean, the dressing. The frosting? The frosting is not vegan, but I have a chocolate vegan glaze in my book that you could use. Now I'm adding the wet ingredients. You're seeing how fast this is coming together. It's crazy. This has a little bit of vinegar. It has water. It has oil. The vinegar and the soda play together to get the rise and to get the texture without any eggs or anything like that. Wow. This is our cake batter. This one we're going to bake. This oh one gosh, is going to go so right moist. in here. And thank God for Al. Look at him helping me. I love That's what that. we say every day. You do? Thank God for Al. I know, yeah. right? Yeah. I would. Amen. Wow. This is going to go into an oven for 45 minutes. And. Bam, bam. Voila. Voila. Easy peasy. Jesse, Jesse. You are so wow. welcome. Yeah. This was so right. fun. Thank you guys. Happy birthday. It's your first time on the so show. You were great. Yes, thank Correct. you. Her new Very book, good. it's called Snackable Bakes. It's out now. And to check out Jesse's recipes, it's today.com. Slash food. Well, of course, you know, it's Superfood Friday, so we're going to tackle those afternoon cravings. Mm. Today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is here showing us how not to, how to make not one, but two tasty snacks to curb after school or after work hunger. Or any time. Or we're we're right. <laughs> right now. We love right it right now. So, Joy, <laughs> you're starting with no-bake peanut butter granola bars. Mm. What goes in? Oh my gosh, guys, I am totally obsessed with these bars. I can't keep my hands out of them. They're sweet, they're salty, they're chewy, and I'm just saying they're good for kids one to 100. Ah. <laughs> this is two cups of whole grain oats. So we know once there's oats in there, one thing I love about these granola bars, you have control over what goes in mm -hmm. and what stays out. So these are good for lowering cholesterol. Um, they're good for evening out blood sugars. I'm adding in just a teaspoon of ground cinnamon and half a teaspoon of salt. That's it. So this is going to be our dry ingredients. Passing this down to Ian Bauer. <laughs> and it's all about the wet ingredients okay. now. So here, the star, our creamy peanut butter. So we know we have heart healthy fat. We've got some protein, some fiber. Instead of oil or butter, I'm adding in here just a third cup of natural unsweetened applesauce. Okay. Our sweetener will be a little bit of honey. Honey's going to give it sticking power. It almost acts as a glue mm. together with the peanut butter and vanilla extract. Mm. So that's our wet ingredients. I mix this together and then I'm going to add it in with our dry ingredients. I'm going to save some time. I would keep mixing. Um, you get a bit of Michelle Obama arms here, but it's going to be nice <laughs> and smooth. And I add oh, in. I'm like, is that all it my, <laughs> No, I'm, ju I'm just actually saying that I'm just, trying I'm to just get kidding. Michelle Obama. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> give it to you if you made these every day. There you go. <laughs> right. And so after you mix in your oat combination, I then just put in some chopped peanuts because I want a little bit of texture and also I want the goodness from the peanuts. And of course, you can swap in almond butter and almonds as well. Sure. And sometimes I'm just saying I'm known to put in some chocolate chips. Yeah, of course you can. <laughs> yeah. So this gets all mixed up and I'm going to show you what it looks like now. Ian's going to have Michelle it... Obama arms at this point. <laughs> I put it into a square baking mm. pan just like this, and I have parchment paper oh. underneath because you want to be able to easily lift it out, and then you slice right down the middle right. and then across seven times. I should say I stash this first in the freezer Got to it. firm. Oh, okay. And then oh, here so are the bars. They wow. are so and unbelievable. So and you keep them in the freezer. They don't freeze. They just firm up and they stay chewy. I have a great big batch that I sent to my youngest daughter in college, and she's already requesting more. Well, so we I want to get chocolate chip muffins. Of course we do. <laughs> so, so now we're doing um, chocolate banana muffins. So for the dry ingredients here, I have whole wheat flour, mm -hmm. and I'm mixing in plain unsweetened cocoa powder. Cocoa powder is so great for heart and brain health. A little bit of salt and a little bit of baking soda. So that's it. 
So these are our dry ingredients mm -hmm. right here. I'm making a little bit of a mess. And now for the wet ingredients, and this is where things get How many cutboards do you have? She has a bunch. <laughs> oh, Dylan, I have a lot. I have an entire big drawer filled with cutting boards. <laughs> I love my cutting boards. Some ladies like jewelry. I like cutting That's boards. I'm with you. <laughs> okay, so now I have mashed bananas. Ah. So again, instead of like the butter and the oil, I have three medium ripe mashed bananas, loads of potassium. I'm adding in a little bit of milk mm -hmm. and a little bit. The sweetener here will be maple syrup. Yum. And here I have two eggs. And again, I'm all about that vanilla extract. Too. And so I would mix this up. Yum. And then the wet ingredients again goes into the dry ingredients. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna load it up. So we I'm only have about 20 up. seconds left. Can we see the, the after? Oh, yes. Here we go. So we, we're going to bake it in the oven at 350 just for about 20 minutes. Okay. And I'm going to show you what they look like. And so you'll see some of them are lighter and some of them are darker. And that's because you have the option of omitting that cocoa powder and having a more banana bread yeah, forward tasting that. muffin. But they're so cute. And you could garnish with a lip before you put them in the oven, a little slice of banana. And that's it just really adds that special something. Joy, that is terrific. And thank you, Ian for us as well. Thank you. Uh, for these thank recipes, you so head to today.com slash food. Have you do you cook in a hot kitchen? No, yes. no, but Siri does. It's hot. Yes. Okay. So how sweet is this? No baked dessert from Alex Guarnaschelli, the executive chef and owner of Butter Restaurant here in NYC. Alex, good <laughs> to see you. She's one of our favorites. You getting a little aggression? Out, I Alex? love that I look over and she's. Yeah. By the way, just because you're not baking doesn't mean you can't get a little workout in That's the kitchen. Right. You can That's break right. a sweat, but in a different way. You burn the calories before you eat them. So you're making, you a, making? Crust, right? making a crust, right? I'm making a crust. Here are all the fantastic ingredients. Don't they look so fresh and yes. non-bakeable? <laughs> I just crushed up some uh, cookies. You can bake. You can bake homemade cookies. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. why do that when we can make? When we can just buy some store bought? You crush them with a rolling pin in a bag. Right. Would you open what the kind bag? Of cookies are these? Magic man. These are just straight butter cookies. Okay. They've got some spritzy cookie snickerdoodly notes. I love the tasting mm, that's going on. Goes in here. Yep. Right in there. With th so wait. So this is the no bake cheesecake, right? Th this is the crust. Would you please stir? Sure. And I'm going to add some cheese and cookies and, and, nuts. and, and some toasted almonds. You could you could skip the nuts, by the way, if you wanted to. Okay. If you're not if you're not into not that. that person. You mix it in, and then what happens is we come over here and we just press it in. So I start by pressing this cream cheese and nut and cookie mix, and then check it out. Come yeah, on, you can do this. Press like that right in there. 
Yours Look at this. Better. I've got you guys. Now, we're not baking, but we're cooking. Look at this. I've got one on the crust and oh, one pressing good. it yeah. in. And using the bottom of that... Um, Measuring so this cup. is just nuts, the crushed cookies and the cream cheese. Yep, and you refrigerate that until it sets. You don't need to cook it, and it has no butter in it. You just did a great job, Carson. You know, so you I'm refrigerate you. this or, th or that? No, you this. refrigerate it like this, like this. to okay. let it firm up, and then we just literally paddle the, a little bit is more. Is that cream cheese? This is a pound of cream cheese. Mm -hmm. with just some like I like it, a pound. Fresh orange juice. You want to add this? Yeah, what is this? Condensed milk. So think of it kind of like a, a cousin of key lime pie. Yes. Wow. So we just got orange juice, cream cheese, and condensed milk. Look at you. you really a little baker I love it. at heart. No, it's fun. I love it. You guys sell this stuff? It, it, <laughs> butter? Or no. 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 Desserts? No, we, we bake away. Bake this away, is right? the I'm stuff I do at eat. home. So then that's this, right? Yep. Once it's just mixed together. And we just, go ahead. Look yep. how easy this is. You pour it in. Does it have to set for a little while? Yeah, you put it in the fridge mm. and you let it set for a while. And then for the sauce... Little orange juice again, water. I like to repeat the same ingredients. So it's like not, it's healthy. Yep. I it, think it's healthy. It's very healthy. It's mm -hmm. a little bit caloric, <laughs> but it's very healthy. And then jam with fresh fruit is always a great thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I would do? So we just pulse I would this put, up. I'd put some limoncello in this somehow. You could. Oh, and then could you? This like is actually. Is it to no bake, you mean? This is even easier. This store is bought ice cream pie? Store bought a fresh bought crust. Oh right? my God, it's great. You drop the softened ice cream. Oh I God, chose why would you strawberry. Ever bake you do not need to bake. This is softened strawberry ice cream in a store-bought crust. Mm. We mix it together mm. with jam and strawberries. We freeze this pie up, and you could use, I mean, literally this is ice you cream and up? pie. Freeze it up, strawberries and topping. jam topped on top. Delicious. Check this out. When Delicious. it firms up, it oh looks gosh. like this, right? Mm. Couple strawberries on top. Come on, baby. What's the Palette? drizzle? Can you drizzle me? Oh, drizzle. Al is that balsamic? I never balsamic asked. right balsamic. on top. Balsamic. Oh, I can smell that. Alex. You did it again. This Ooh. is delicious. It's so easy, really. Thank you so much. Okay, so for these out. recipes, in head today.com slash food. She's here this morning on Today Food. Our friend Samadada is back to show us two easy recipes to close out summer. And in this heat, the best part is there's no cooking yeah. involved. No cooking Good morning. Involved. I, like I, I always guys. see you on Instagram. Hi, I'm so happy you're you're back and, and cooking for us because your food looks so, happy so delicious here. all the time. I'm so happy to be here. I want to always create really easy, healthy recipes. Mm -hmm. No ovens required yes. here. That's so great. they're perfect for the end of summer. This looks yummy. What is this? So this is my chilled chickpea salad. Super easy to make. Mm -hmm. I love recipes where you just kind of throw everything in one bowl, mix yeah. it up, lots of flavors, lots of textures. So we're going to start with some diced cucumbers, okay? Mm -hmm. So we can just go ahead and dice it. I know we're on TV, so I'm going to just Be do my little, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. That. What do you mean? Dylan's, Dylan's like a Dylan, pro. Dylan, you I'll, I'll dice while you talk, yes. I'll Dylan's just a pro. To, also, you call them chickpeas. Is there, is there a difference between, between the chickpea and the garbanzo bean, or is that the same? It's the same thing. Okay. It's yeah. the same thing. And you know what? I am not above a canned chickpea. Okay. I love That's a canned chickpea. Do you rinse them? first? You do. So for this
this recipe, definitely rinse and drain them, but okay. they're easy, they're accessible, they're yeah, affordable. You can find them. So, wow, beautiful. Thank you, Dylan. Great job. Okay, great. So, we've Thanks. got our uh, diced tomatoes already in here. Okay. So, we're going to do that. Good, we're going to add dicing our dicing tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, we're not, I'm wearing all white. Not yeah. a good choice. <laughs> Dump that Cucumbers in. Cucumbers in there. We've got some diced red onions. Okay. And then I'm going to go in with my chickpeas, again, drained and rinsed. Mm -hmm. Right in there. Does it matter what kind of tomato you use, Summer? You know, I would actually prefer for you to use a really nice ripe tomato. Okay. If it's in season, even better. Okay. But okay. you can use grape tomato, cherry tomato, okay. whatever it calls these. to you. Okay. Oh. Okay, great. So we're going to add try. some lime juice. Dylan, I'm going to make you just okay. do that because yes. you're a pro. Just, just put me to work. <laughs> there you go. And then now, this is my favorite mm. thing. After we add some lime juice, some olive oil. Mm. We're gonna add some good. chopped masala. Oh, so chopped masala is a spice blend oh. that's really common in Indian street food. Yes. It's delicious. It's got cumin, coriander. So that's what takes it up. I powder. was just about to say, I didn't see yeah. that coming. Yeah, it's a Ooh, little that tangy, is that a little is savory. Fantastic. Where can we get that? Credits. Salt. You can get it online. Honestly, the internet chopped is our masala. BFF. You know this what I'm saying? This is great, Sharma. Actually, send some to us. Salt. And it's healthy too, right? Very healthy and oh, look wow. like it's packed with protein. It's got lots of veggies, that cilantro? texture. That's cilantro, mm -hmm. little salt, a little mm -hmm. freshly ground black that's pepper. Olive oil? And this is olive oil. Really simple. Girl, this really is easy to make. I'm so glad you and like it. Fresh. This is it's amazing. chilled, it's refreshing. Mm -hmm. We love it. And that so gives a little spice to A it. little spice, a little kick. Okay. And now another really easy no bake recipe. Okay. I love carrot cake, but sometimes I just don't want to turn my oven on. Right. You know what I mean? I don't blame you. So these have become my new carrot cake best friend. Okay. So first we're gonna grate some carrots. By Done. the way, everything comes together in a blender. Okay. So you can grate your carrots using a box grater. We've got some unsweetened shredded coconut in here. Coconut. Add our carrots. If you you guys follow me on Instagram, you know I don't you stop love, talking about dates. Yeah. I like you it's all, you always love like dates. Dates. It's, it's like session. all I talk about. It's yeah. getting not normal. All right, let's um, go. Dates in there. We've Just got some. Just make sure you get that pit out before you oh, put it in there. Please pit them. I've ruined a recipe with a couple. <laughs> Definitely date pit pits. them. I'm using yeah. medjool dates, which are really sweet. They've got a nice juicy okay. flesh. Some cashews, cashews for that really nice buttery base. And then all of the usual suspects with carrot cake. Mm -hmm. We've got some cinnamon, some ground ginger, some salt. Nothing healthy. Vanilla extract. Mm -hmm. And then what I like to do, it's kind of fun to get your kids involved as well. You okay. get this dough, blend it until it's nice and pulverized. Hey. And now, what? <laughs> that's be that's, that's <laughs> much better than shocked. I was expecting. Look, I do like it, Sam. I am. That is much better than I was like expecting. Rita, Sam. <laughs> the actual shock on Craig's face right now. Yeah, well, right. Make them into little up. bites. Wait, and it roll it like cake. And so you know what I like to do? Get some nice like mixed okay. salted nuts. Mm -hmm. You can use your favorite. I'm using pistachios and pecans mm -hmm. here, but use your fave. And then you can just roll it in the nuts. This so gives a nice little that, like oh, wow. sweet and salty mm -hmm. situation. You know, mm -hmm. I love a little that sweet is. and salty. No bake. Super really easy really to make. They would really, really love it. It's really delicious. It's also mm. fun to get the kids involved with making it, Just right? Because so it's very hands-on. Sama is like my girl crush and my inspiration, <laughs> even though she's like young enough to be my child. Stop. Like when I first met her, she worked for NBC and she was like glowing. And you know me, I went up to her, I'm like, what do you do? Like, what, she drinks how do you two look like this? Water every day. And then she started introducing us to her cooking. We're like, this is why she's right. so glowy. Oh. No me. I love it. It's delicious. It also kind of tastes like oatmeal cookie dough. Oh my god. It does. It's right? a definite cookie dough vibe, yes. right? Oh, because it's it. really chewy. Hi there, good morning. Welcome to The Boost. We've got an inspiring show for you, so let's dive right in. First up, Army veteran Sean Warner. He pursued a childhood dream of becoming a writer, and the book went to number one thanks to a viral video from a TikToker named Red. The two men reunited right here on Today and shared how one small act of kindness can change a life. It was a small act of kindness. Same thing, just sign it? Yeah, if you could just sign it that helped turn a first-time novelist into an overnight bestseller. You know, when Red came up and talked to me, I was just so eager to talk to anybody at that point. TikToker Red first discovered author Sean Warner earlier this month at a grocery store in Fort Worth, Texas. It was near the self-checkout line when he saw the writer all alone at a table with a stack of books and a weary look on his face. I do uh, a little bit of TikTok and whatnot, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get a second one. I'm going to gift it on there and see if we can get you a little bit of love on there. Oh, okay. I won't say no. <laughs> <laughs> Red's video quickly gaining more than 18 million views and more than 3 million likes on the app. I wasn't expecting this video to blow up like this. People coming together, it's, this is so beautiful. And with the power of the book talk hashtag attracting a diverse reading community. Came in the mail. Super excited to read it. I'm so excited to read it. Thank you, Sean. 
Warner's debut novel, Lee Howard and the Ghosts of Simmons Pierce Manor, amassed five-star reviews, climbing the ranks on Amazon's bestseller list. It was just an amazing thing, and it's all on you for your kindness and generosity. Thank you. And winning over new fans from all around the world. Ah, Sean, you're made it to Germany. Warner, an Army veteran and former paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division, went on to work as a software engineer before losing his job from company-wide layoffs years ago. That setback did not stop the father of two from moving forward. Instead, he decided to pursue his childhood dream of being a writer. The love just keeps pouring out. And as always, thanks to Red, your big heart and your generosity got this whole ball rolling. Now it's a new beginning for the novelist, all thanks to one stranger's good deed. Okay, this is so cool. We're so happy to say joining us now is best-selling author, Sean Warner. Sean, this is an incredible story, an act of kindness. Tell us what it felt like when you when you realized that your book was actually climbing the charts. You are watching it in real time. Um, it started out with a lot of confusion. <laughs> we, we didn't know what was happening. Our phones were going off, and we had no clue what was happening. And our daughter actually said, Dad's gone viral on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> and you, just to be clear, you've never met Red before? You just happened to be at that grocery store? I, I was at Kroger signing the books, um, and Red saw me sitting alone and came over and said hello and you know, brightened up my day, and then it just brightened up my life. Ah, oh, it sure did. It really changed everything. We want to bring Red in. I think he's here. Yeah. Hey, Red, Red. You oh, there, come out? there you come are. On. You haven't seen each other since that day, that fateful moment. Hey, <laughs> hey forget that. <laughs> oh, thank you, you so much. No problem. No oh. problem. Oh. Sit out, Red. Will you tell us, when you walked up on that table and you said you saw a guy, you had not a great look on his face, not feeling the best. Tell us about that. Uh, honestly. Well, my brother sent me to go get ice cream. I was supposed to be at a birthday party. So I was I was beelining it straight for the frozen food section. <laughs> and I saw Sean and I, I don't know, something just registered with me. You know, I, I, I feel like I have a lot of passion for other people. I'm a big people person. Yeah. So when I saw him and he didn't have a smile on his face, it, it just made me want to change it. So yeah. that's all I did. I, I was like, hey, can I make a video of you? And, and it took off. I, honestly, I, I did such a small part. It really it came down to the people. Like, the people decided, and, and it took off. Like. It, it really took off. And, Sean, I just want to point out, since you are a best-selling author, people are giving this book great reviews as yes. well. You're get, So they're buying it. They're not buying it just to be nice people. They're buying it, they're reading it, and they're loving it. <laughs> that, was, that was a hurdle for me to get over, because the last thing I wanted was sympathy. Yeah. You know, a, a pity review, or pity buys and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But um, after I got over that and I started reading some of these just really gracious reviews, then then it was like, okay, I got to sit back and start enjoying this Enjoy, now. Enjoy, yes. You were getting choked up, Sean, looking at people from all over the country and really around the world holding mm -hmm. your book up. It arrived yeah. in the mail. What was that right. like? It was, um, it was just incredible, something I never thought had happened. But what really warms my heart, and I'm going to get choked up again, um, <clears throat> when parents say they're reading it with their kids. Yeah. <laughs> it's what every writer <laughs> would hope. It's the dream. Jared, yeah. what about for you? What has this meant for you? Honestly, so much. Like, again, I'm a big people person, and I, I always joke, you know, I go, I tell people, you, could you imagine, thank God the book was good, because could you imagine the world back if it wasn't, you know? <laughs> and, you know, so many people, like hundreds of people have messaged me, whether they're authors or they're illustrators or whatever it may be, and a lot of people have messaged me saying that, you know, Sean's book, you know, it. it I think it started out as being a nice gesture to somebody, but then everybody kind of rallied and it became almost as if his success was our success, mm. you know, and the people just got behind I mean, That's it. a beautiful yeah. way of putting it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Well, if there's a moral to the story, yeah. it's how a simple act of kindness can do so much. Sean isn't the only one gaining viral fame. This next dad turned author became a viral sensation at the age of 74, thanks to the help of his daughter, and the TikTok that changed everything. Our resident reader, Jenna Bush Hager, has that story. Oh my gosh. This is 74-year-old Lloyd Devereaux Richards from Montpelier, Vermont. Well, now we got, uh, oh boy. 
He's reacting to the news that his novel he published 11 years ago just reached number one in the serial killer thriller genre on Amazon. His path to literary stardom has been nothing short of a social media miracle. Just two weeks ago, Lloyd's daughter, Marguerite, posted this video introducing the world to her father, the author, and the story behind his crime thriller, Stone Maidens, a passion project written little by little over 14 years. Sales had almost entirely dropped off when Marguerite went to TikTok, hoping to get a few more people to read her dad's work. So far, her video has been viewed more than 47 million times. In the last week, Lloyd went from having almost no sales in a decade to having the number one book of any genre on Amazon. Definitely a good read already. All while inspiring his millions of new fans to fall deeper in love with reading and to never, ever give up. These last couple of days, I just, I, I can't understand it. I feel blessed. Oh my We're gosh, so lucky. we have Lloyd Devereaux Richards, author of Stone Maidens, and his daughter, Marguerite Richards, making their exclusive television debut here with us. You, Good morning. Oh my gosh, Good morning. Lloyd, watching that, how much your daughter loves you, uh, and, and knowing that it took a bit to get here, but here you are, how does it feel? Uh, overwhelming still. Um, I'm very grateful to her and to everybody here without my daughter, and her love and support of me, um, this would not be happening. This is so beautiful, and it's about so much more than a book. It's about a father and his daughter. So, Marguerite, tell us how you came up with the idea, how you <laughs> got it up on TikTok, and then how stunned you must have been as nearly 50 million people viewed this. Yeah, so I grew up watching my dad write. I knew how much time he put into it. He'd work all day. He'd come home, have dinner with me and my brothers and spend time with us and grab little pockets of writing. And then when it published, we were so excited. They like, so proud of him. And um, over the next 11 years, there wouldn't be much uh, of, a, of a following or readers. And so he was never negative. He always stayed positive. And in fact, he kept writing. And so when he finished the sequel last summer, it touched me because no one had read his first book. Mm. So that broke my heart a little. And I was like, I mentioned to him, like, Dad, what if I made a little video on TikTok? And he didn't know what, as he said, <laughs> Tic Tac was. <laughs> so um, he kind of just, it just didn't happen. And then when I caught him rifling through his papers in that first video, that's where he wrote the book, I was just kind of going through making a video without him really knowing. And I created an account and posted it. And no one knew this. And uh, yeah, just in the hopes that a few people would read his first book, that was what I was hoping. A few. Well, yeah, Lloyd, to know that it was number one, to know that it's become you know a bestseller, after all these years. Um, I, uh, I'm speechless. Uh, I am. I think when she showed me the comments when she revealed it, you showed a piece of that. Uh, this. So, so many people were saying such kind things to me. It gave me um, a totally different opinion uh, from, you know, I, I didn't know that young people wanted to even uh, read a book like mine or that they were reading so much. And it seems like they really are reading. And that really touched me that our country's in good shape if people want to read books. Oh, I feel that same way. And yeah. we know that you feel so grateful that this social media miracle helped elevate your book. And you wanted to give a, a couple other authors a little shout out, which just says yes. everything about you. Um, will you tell us your your recommendations if people want to read? Absolutely. Um, I live in Vermont, like you know, and uh, my first book, Cursed in New England by Joseph Citro, he's sort of a storyteller himself and speaks in theater, schools, uh, you know, elaborating with theatrical ability, his stories about curses and strange Ooh. disappearances in New England, largely in Vermont, Fun. based on true at least accounts. The second book, um, What Remains of Her by Eric Rick Rickstead is a thriller in rural Vermont set mm -hmm. there. And again, um, he, he wrote a fine book. And uh, like myself, it just didn't reach all that many readers. And uh, the third is State of Redemption by Richard McEwen. It's independently published in uh, 2021. 
It's uh, about two lives headed in opposite directions with one thing in common. They were both witnesses to a murder. Oh. Oh. And it's an excellent read. And uh, again, um, not very well circulated. So. Well, we know one thing. Your second book is going to get a lot of attention. Um, and you know what? We're also really excited because we know that your book isn't sold uh, in many stores, but we wanted to tell you that we love you so much and we want other people to read your book. So right across the street, hopefully we can see it, at the shop at 30 Rock, right there. Do you see right there? We have an entire window dedicated to Stone Maiden so that visitor, visitors can stop in. And buy it in person. So maybe you can come and do a signing. What do you think about that? Uh, definitely. I would love to. <laughs> okay. Well, you are the hottest author in America after all. So it benefits us a little bit too. Oh, <laughs> thank you. That's incredible. We wow. just want to say that this dedication that you've uh, continued in your craft and also this admiration you have for your dad is something we admire so much. Thank, thank you both. Thank you, thank you so much. It oh, and he and has I have two books. Oh my gosh. Both of you uh, oh. that I've inscribed for you oh. and uh, just want to make sure I this I was going to buy you, one Jenna. at the thank store, you. but I'll yeah. take this one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, thank you. You can check out Stone Maidens and Lloyd's full list of recommendations at today.com slash books. Thank you both. Just ahead, some hair care that is sure to inspire. Stay with us. here on The Boost and we are heading to the barber shop for an act of sheer genius from a husband and wife duo. They use their creativity to come up with an app that has been a game changer in the hair care business and has earned them a fitting name. Al Roker explains. Our industry has actually nicknamed us Hair b, &B. And that's like the easiest way to describe what we do. Husband and wife duo, Ty and Courtney Caldwell, are a force in the hair industry. Courtney, the marketing pro. Ty, with nearly 30 years of barbering experience. Make sure you look clean. Having run his barbershop, Salon 74, in Plano, Texas, for more than 20 years. I started cutting hair when I was 10 years old with a pair of paper scissors from school. I'm the seventh of eight kids. We couldn't afford to go to the barbershop or the salon every week. The couple actually met at Ty's barbershop. I was sitting in this chair right here, um, and I remember it like it was yesterday. Together they run Shearshare, an app that connects barbershop and salon owners with freelance professionals in the industry. You can actually go into the app and list your space and your, your station, your, your suites can get booked like you're booking a hotel. Yeah. It all started in 2012, when the industry Ty loved started to shift. People started opening suites and having their own private little businesses, so we wanted to kind of get into the same rat race. However, their suites were often empty, but things changed when they received a call from an independent stylist with a unique request. She asked to rent out our suite on a Friday, Saturday, and I thought it was the craziest idea. She just yeah. wanted to be in a salon where she had all the accoutrements that yes. she went to school to learn. Yes. The chair, the lighting, the mirror. You don't have this in anyone's home. 
her clients loved the experience so much to where she started asking us to do the same thing in Houston and in Austin and down the street in McKinney, Texas. Ty and Courtney immediately seeing a way to help shop owners like themselves fill their empty chairs and for beauty professionals to rent out space anywhere without signing a long-term contract. And the crazy part is that 40% of chairs sit unused every single day in your neighborhood salon and barbershop. And it shouldn't be that way. The duo started by building trust with local businesses. It was going door to door to salons and barbershops saying, hey, I noticed that you've had five chairs sit empty for the last month. I can help you fill that with qualified talent. To fund their business, they dipped into their retirement accounts. And in 2017, opening up their first rental suites at Salon 74. Today, Shearshare is an app used in nearly 900 cities across the country. A win-win for both stylists and shop owners. I use Shearshare to go to some of my older clients who live on the other side of town. It gives me the salon setting as opposed to going to their house. Yeah. We're now able to help you fill your chairs. We're able to help professionals come out of school day one and start working. That's right, yeah. And so we're giving them opportunity to grow where they never thought about it. As the hair industry continues to change, Ty and Courtney see Sheer Share as an important addition. I think that what we've built is the future of work. When I think about Sheer Share, 10, 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. I see it being that B2B ecosystem where if you choose to be creative in this space, whatever tool you need in order to be successful and have a long-term successful career in this industry, yeah. we have it for you. That way. <laughs> Turning now to a son who went to great lengths for his mom when radiation treatment for a benign brain tumor caused her to lose her hair. Kate Snow has more on the life-changing gift from a son to his mother. Look at that hair, huh? Oh, it's actually really cool. This is so much more than just a hair appointment for Melanie Shehe. Hey, Matt Shehe. It's a moment years in the making, all thanks to her son, Matt. Oh, it was absolutely remarkable. For nearly 20 years, Melanie has been battling a benign brain tumor. Four years ago, she started radiation treatment, which caused her to lose all her hair. My hair is not going to return. The tumor and the treatment took not just a physical toll, but an emotional one as well. It was hard. I don't mind being sick, uh, but I do mind looking sick. I can tell that the most recent radiation kind of took a toll on her. She would make more comments on, on her appearance. That's when an idea came to him, when his family was commenting that he needed a haircut. I jokingly said, well, what if I just kept growing it to make a wig for you, Mom? And then it clicked. It took two years for Matt to go from this to this, growing an extra 12 inches of hair. It was a no-brainer for a mom like her. Mm. Absolute no-brainer. Oh, man. This March, it was time to take it all off. As Melanie looked on, never expected it to mean as much as it did to me. When it happened, when we had cut it off, and it was very real, it was very emotional. What were the feelings? It's just so emotional that he uh, went two years and gave a gift like that. Sorry. <laughs> it's very emotional, very touching. We love you. So we'll see you to bed. They sent it off, and weeks Bye. later, a wig came back. It had been nearly five right. years since Melanie had been to a hairstylist. When you saw yourself with the wig on, what, what did you think? Knowing it's Matt's hair, you know, it was really spectacular. My mother has given everything for me growing up, and this is giving such a small thing back, you know, compared to what she's given me in life. For his mom, there was nothing small about this gift. It's such a great gift uh, to have um, your son see you with compassion, you know, know what you needed. That feels lovely <laughs> to be loved and seen that way. When we come back, the touching story of a beloved New York police officer, how his memory is inspiring something amazing. Stay with us.
Welcome back to The Boost. After a beloved police officer in Rochester, New York, was killed in the line of duty, his wife worried he would be forgotten. But a former colleague and friend was determined to make sure that never happens. Harry Smith has more. Maybe you heard about this a few weeks back. A retired Rochester, New York police officer running 50 marathons in 50 days through eight states. Brett Soborowski told us he ran to raise money for the family of and to bring honor to fallen comrade Tony Mazurkowitz. I just knew I wanted to do something. I wanted, I wanted somehow to make a difference and show his family and to honor his sacrifice. Brett hoped to run into the city with a cohort of 500. Almost a thousand showed up. A touching tribute, no question. A moving moment. But what of the slain officer? What was his story? The consensus is he was a little crazy for dating because he's younger than I am. And he was 24. Well, he must have been a force he could not resist. Lynn had two kids when she and Tony married. Then they had two more. How proud were you to be married to a police officer? I was proud to be married to him. It didn't matter what he did. Mm. He was amazing. Described by all as a super dad, Maz, as everyone called him, cared for his grandkids every Tuesday. He had Papa Tuesdays. I got yelled at last week by one of them because I can't cut waffles like Papa did. A super dad and an exemplary cop. Citations and awards filled his record, 29 years on the job. Rochester Police Force members Kenny Coniglio, Kelly Lusk, and Michael DePaola filled us in. Tony's a cop's cop. As far as accolades go for policemen, there's no higher accolade than to call somebody a cop's cop. And that's Tony all day long. Yeah, you 100% want to be around him. Made you a better cop, made you a better person. He was a rock in the unit, a mentor, a leader, and he was hilarious. He absolutely was, yes. Hands down, the funniest person you'd ever meet. How much do you miss this guy? A ton. Tremendously. At least one male approached the officers and opened fire on them. Maz had for years been part of the Rochester Police Tactical Unit. Difficult, dangerous work. Yet Lynn was certain Maz would always make it home. It never, never, ever, ever occurred to me he wouldn't come home. Did you have a sign about that someplace? Yes. What did the sign say? I'll see you in the morning. It was on the door or on the wall right there. Does it seem real? No, not a minute. I still wait for him. I, it seems like it's been forever and it's almost a year. No, it doesn't seem real because we still wait for him. I haven't moved his slippers or his backpack and I probably never will. That run into the city, all those marathons, Brett Soborowski raised over $100,000. He's the kindest, man genuinely mm. but he's crazy <laughs> i mean he's insane nobody does that 50 marathons yeah yeah he's insane the money raised the continuing compassion and companionship of her husband's fellow officers well it's all helped lynn a lot what do you want people to know about tony i wanted them to remember his name i want them to know that police officers are so much more than the uniform they wear, their wives, their husbands, their sisters, their daughters, their sons, their fathers, their papas. They're not just the uniform. Coming up, we've got the latest viral video to boost your day. Stay with us.
Welcome back to The Boost. It's time for our final story, and this one will surely make you smile. Check it out. What's better than a little friendly competition among your closest pals? So not much. Just ask a group of friends. They're trying to record the top speed in front of a traffic speed check. Take a look. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Wow. That's amazing. Oh, that's great. Look at that. Look, that's fast. All right, you can wow. see the radio signs work even if you're not in a car. According to the competitors, Whoa. the sidewalk time trials took place very late at night after a very big dinner. And in case you're wondering, who took Grinch. home the gold medal? Is that Greg? Oh, wow. It was Greg. Greg. Wait, Greg had a speed of 17 wow. miles per hour run. Okay, that's hilarious. Don't you want that's it for today. We hope we started your day off with a little positivity. We will see you tomorrow with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day. I'm Keir Simmons and welcome to the Royal Rundown, or for today, I'll call it the Royal Runway. That's right, we'll be exploring the fashion of the Royal Family, we'll show you why what the Windsors wear matters, each outfit representing much more than what meets the eye. Plus, did you know, before the Duchess of Sussex was part of the Royal Family, she was a style contributor right here on Today. We'll revisit one of Meghan Markle's segments later in the show. And do you want to dress like a princess? We'll meet a social media influencer recreating royal looks on a budget. But first, why does all this matter? No one knows that better than fashion journalist Elizabeth Holmes. Her New York Times best-selling book, HRH, So Many Thoughts on Royal Style, is a deep dive into the clothing choices of the royals and how each sends an underlying message about their values and interests. Royal style is singular in its power and its purpose. Certainly before this generation, royal women didn't tend to speak. For the most part, their job is to appear. Those images are spread around the world in seconds, and before you know what a royal woman is doing, or where she's going, or what cause she's supporting, you see what she's wearing. The thing about Queen Elizabeth is that I don't know that she was interested in fashion, but she understood the power of clothes and the role of clothes in her royal duties. She developed this wardrobe that she was sort of known for, right? A working wardrobe of colorful styles. But it was fashion too because she played with colors, she played with textures, she played with different embellishments on her hat, and it turned her into this like brightly colored, delightful grandma figure. Queen Elizabeth set the stage for royal fashion and she made it something that people paid attention to. What Diana did was make royal fashion exciting. She embraced trends in a way that the queen never did. One of my favorite quotes too is from a photographer who said, we didn't even care about the engagement, we just showed up to see what Diana was wearing. And that was the power of it. And Diana hit the stage at the time that the modern media landscape was exploding. So there were glossy fashion magazines, all of a sudden they needed to fill their pages. And here was this beautiful statuesque blonde princess who was wearing all this exciting fashion. And I think what was so special about Diana is that she enjoyed fashion, you could tell. So Kate entered the scene and I think she made royal fashion accessible and relatable in a way. From what I understand, Kate was not necessarily super into fashion, but I think she is now. And <laughs> I think you can tell by the spirit of some of what she wears. After she had Prince Louis, she sort of stepped back onto the scene in this really exciting way that to me suggests she has really embraced fashion and is having fun with fashion. There's one dress, it was a shirt dress, and it had a slight slit. 
and I feel like the old Kate would have sewn up that slit a little bit. She kept it open. And you just saw enough of her leg that everyone was like, whoa, what's happening here? And she looked fabulous. And it only works because what we had come to expect from Kate was so sort of traditional and classic and safe. And so suddenly when she has those moments, it's, I think it's very exciting. Megan really shook up the royal fashion conversation in a really welcome way. I think she understood better than anyone the power of clothing, the attention of clothing, the language of clothing, because she had worked on a set with a costume designer that's their whole game is to speak through clothes. And what she did, it sounds so silly in hindsight, but it, she modernized it by wearing things like trousers, which is something that every modern woman everywhere wears pants, right? But because Megan was wearing suddenly like a black suit, you're like, wait, that's not what we usually see from royal fashion. And people who did not um, sort of see themselves in Kate's style, I think perhaps saw themselves in Meghan's. And so what she did was she took the royal fashion audience and made it much bigger. When royals tour around the world, they use their fashion as sartorial diplomacy, as sort of soft power, and to speak in a way that you don't have to use a voice. And I think there's such power in that, and it takes a lot of work. Back in the Queen's Day and then Diana's Day, there would be a whole team that would go and scope out other locations and they would pick out outfits based on the background. And they would study the colors of a country's flag. They would study the country's flowers. One of my favorite pictures of the Queen is when she came to California in 1983. She went to a dinner in a gown covered in California poppies. And you think, wow, somebody somewhere was like, California, the state flower is the poppy. We need a dress. And then they made this beautiful dress that speaks specifically to California. Royal women are also very cognizant of how much to incorporate local dress into what they're wearing. And the queen was really careful with this because you don't want it to look costumey, but you definitely want to look as though you're aware of what people are wearing and dress accordingly. And we saw that brilliantly with Kate in Pakistan. She turned to local designers, she wore local dress. If you see here, she's wearing the color of the uniform of the kids. Can you even believe that? And you know, the day before she was wearing the colors of the Pakistani flag. I think it's just beautiful. So dressing for the slideshow is a term I came up with on Instagram because it's a nod to the slideshows that fashion websites like to compile, but it's thinking about not just a single look on its own, but a sequence or a cadence of looks. Kate has stepped out for Trooping the Color in a bright green design, and then a couple days later at Garter Day, she wore white, and then at Royal Ascot, she wore red. And you think, oh, red is like a very bold color, and you know, for Ascot in the past, she's worn softer pastel so why would she be wearing red? But it's because the green, white, and red together make up the colors of the Welsh flag. And for her first time doing all these engagements as the Princess of Wales, I thought that was a really lovely nod. Royal fashion has changed in a number of ways. I think first and foremost, it's changed because it is now shoppable in a way that it never used to be. When Queen Elizabeth was a young queen, she wore a few off the rack pieces, but mostly it was bespoke. It was custom for her. And so you could sort of admire royal fashion without taking part in it. By the time Catherine became the Duchess of Cambridge, suddenly e-commerce made it possible to shop what she was wearing. And then you could feel like you were having a part of it in a really sort of special way. So repeating outfits is a big part of the royal fashion conversation. I think repeating fashion is a sign that these are working wardrobes, that these are pieces that they invest in. And so there'll be headlines like, Kate's worn this co coat four times. And it's like, well, every woman has a coat in her closet that she's worn like 40 times, probably, hopefully. But it makes them seem, I think, more human in a really helpful way. In this moment, the Princess of Wales is the one to watch. She joined the royal family over a decade ago. Since then, her style choices have changed the conversation. And what is known as the Kate Effect began. Molly Hunter has more. The Princess of Wales has been called a fashion inspiration, icon and influencer. She's simple but elegant, understated but regal, accessible but elevated. The princess is renowned for her powerful impact on fashion 
known as the Kate Effect. The shopping stampede began with the blue Issa dress that Kate wore for her engagement announcement in 2010, which sold out in 24 hours. The trend continued with the Reese dress she wore to meet the Obamas at Buckingham Palace in 2014, and unprecedented demand for that dress caused Reese's website to crash, and sales for British shoe designer Camilla Elphick went off the scale, one style selling out after Kate was spotted wearing them. Her choices are even credited with giving a boost to the economy. It has been said that Kate has a billion dollar effect on the British economy, and that's because she has really helped to promote not only British luxury brands, but brands across the world. While the princess's love is known for British designers like Jenny Packham and Alexander McQueen, responsible for her wedding dress, red carpet stunners, and powerhouse suits, she also frequents more accessible brands like Barber and LK Bennett. She mixes luxury looks with affordable accessories, like this Alexander McQueen gown paired with Zara earrings. And although she's next in line to be queen, Kate is not above recycling some of her beloved looks. Serving as a model of sustainable fashion, she balances between the glamorous and down-to-earth, giving people around the globe access to her look. In 2016, Kate appeared on the cover of British Vogue's 100th anniversary issue, surprising everyone with her casual look, jeans in the countryside. Another reason we love Kate's style, the similarities to that of her mother-in-law, Princess Diana, the previous Princess of Wales. For the royal family, what one wears to an event is almost as important as the occasion itself. And from coronations to royal affairs, we can always count on Kate to deliver a show-stopping look. Even her husband, Prince William, agrees. And the legacy extends to the next generation. There's growing interest in the clothing that her children are sporting. As the princess's role continues to evolve, so does her style, and we'll be watching the future queen and her style evolution every step of the way. We can't wait to see what Kate wears next. After the break, Princess Diana in the spotlight. We revisit some of her most iconic looks. Plus, Meghan Markle fashion contributor? We look back at her time at Today, sharing the best looks for the summer. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Royal Rundown. We now step into the shoes of the late Princess Diana, who knew the power of fashion. Many of her outfits still popular today. E! News's Erin Lim Rhodes has more. Take a look. Princess Diana's fashion legacy continues to reign supreme. There's no doubt that the royal left her mark on the world, redefining the role of a princess and shaping pop culture. She also cemented herself as a style icon with coveted looks that have stood the test of time. From chic athleisure to that jaw-dropping revenge dress, here's a look at Princess Diana's fashion moments that we're still obsessed with.
And now more on Princess Diana with a look back at her iconic style thanks to an exclusive exhibit held just down the street at Kensington Palace. I got the chance to tour the exhibit back in 2017 and let me tell you, seeing some of her wardrobe in real life as they say is something I will never forget. Princess Diana, the most famous and photographed woman in the world. She balanced really well the whole idea of capturing press attention, really speaking loudly through her clothes to absolutely enormous audiences. Diana, her fashion story, celebrates her style with 25 dresses. It charts her fashion journey from shy teenager to international icon. It includes the dress she wore to the White House, dancing with John Travolta, to the dress she wore on the cover of Harper's Bazaar. There's a dress that people will remember because of what happened when she was wearing it. She famously danced in the White House with John Travolta, wow. and it was one of those amazing moments. Said Cyrus, along with his wife, Catherine Walker, designed many of the dresses in this exhibit. Wherever she went, people wanted to see her as a British princess. She was, after all, the future queen, uh, a British ambassador. These were, after all, work clothes. The Versailles Palace was the inspiration for this dress the princess wore in 1994. But what did strike me was the way in which the light came through. What we designed was something which we felt would show the princess shining through a frame. This is a really poignant one. Also on display, some of her favourite dresses she auctioned off for charity just two months before her death. Like this Versace dress worn just after she separated from the Prince of Wales. She's saying, I, I've separated, I'm my own person. She was asserting her independence, but she was also, I think, by this point had really solidified and understood and stamped her own style. The garments that we see here are testament to, um, to her legacy in many ways. These, these garments then became mementos of the princess. What legacy did she leave for the fashion world? The princess is hugely relevant. On a personal level, so many people all around the world somehow still see a piece of themselves in the princess. A voice that was silenced way too early. While that exhibit is now closed, Kensington Palace's largest exhibit ever, Crown to Couture, is currently open to the public until October. Coming up, diamonds, rubies, emeralds. Oh my, our very own Savannah Guthrie got a chance to try on all the royal jewels earlier this year. Plus, royal fashion on a budget, the social media influencer who recreates Kate's looks for everyday wear after the break.
Welcome back. The fascination with royal attire is not just about the clothes. Remember, we are talking about queens and princesses here, and everyone has a royal crown. Oh, many crowns. Well, our very own Savannah Guthrie wanted in on the action. Watch as she gets a taste of what royal jewels shopping is all about. Royals and fashion go hand in hand. Throughout the ages, royals have been style influencers and trendsetters. These days, Catherine, the Princess of Wales, wears that crown. But every time she wears a new outfit, it immediately sells out. For royals, what one wears to an event is almost as important as the occasion itself. Hats are a must for royal races. Then there are the royal weddings, the annual Trooping the Colour, state banquets and the opening of Parliament, crowns, tiaras and jewels. For the King and Queen's coronation, the crown jewels take centre stage. Important pieces for the big day include the Imperial State Crown and the Royal Scepter with a Cross, all made or modified by Garrod, who reigned for 164 years as the first official crown jeweler. Wow! <laughs> I feel well, royal already. <laughs> this room was actually named um, after Queen Mary with her kind permission. It's Queen Mary would come here. Yes. Well, so you've had a lot of royalty over the years. Yes, we have. So on Coronation Day, we will see jewels that were designed here. Yes. Tell me about them. Okay, so we have, um, we actually have a, um original artwork here of Queen Mary's contour crown. So that was designed and made um, by Garage for Queen Mary in 1911. And Queen Consort Camilla is going to actually she is. wear she, this, this is crown. The crown that she's going to be wearing. What about the Imperial crown? So the Imperial State crown, that was remade totally by Garage in 1937. Well, very bedazzled here. <laughs> so you're looking at some replicas of um, tiaras, historical tiaras that Garrett had made. Can we look at them? Yes. Oh, yeah, of course we can. Let us see. Oh, what do we think? Perfect on you. <laughs> you have the perfect hair for a tiara. Oh, good. I'm so glad. That's how <laughs> I've just been going my whole life waiting for the right tiara. <laughs> There's also another iconic creation to their credit. You're, you're sporting some beautiful bling as well, and I feel like I've seen this before. A beautiful example of this is uh, Princess of Wales' engagement ring, um, which was formerly worn by the previous Princess of Wales, Diana. Hers is obviously a little bit larger than this one. But <laughs> this is pretty large. But this one's pretty, pretty special this as well. This will do. <laughs> Someone who has worn many royal jewels over the last few years, Meghan Markle. As a working royal, the Duchess of Sussex dazzled with her fashion-forward looks. But before she joined this family, she was a member of the Today Show family, a Today Show contributor, giving her take on the up and coming fashion trends. Can you believe it? Here's a look back at one of her segments from 2015, a year before she even started dating Prince Harry. Meghan Markle is back. She plays the always fashionable Rachel Zane on USA's hit series Suits, but she's multi-talented. She also runs her own fashion and lifestyle website called The Tig. Meghan, good morning. Good, good to see morning. you. Good to see you too. We've got four great trends yes. and we're going to show how the celebrities wear them and then how the rest of us can wear Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And they're all pretty easy to pepper into your wardrobe, so it should be fun. Okay, so the first one is matching print Tops and bottoms, we've seen this on Taylor Swift, Michelle yeah. Obama, Carrie Washington. What's the key to wearing the trend? Oh, it's fantastic. And it's actually really doable, right? So you want to look at matching prints, and they can be subtle. So you can see as you here has the vertical print on the bottom, horizontal up top. And then you keep it really edgy, fresh, and modern with like a nice structured sandal. But it's simple to pepper in. And then a little sliver of skin. I don't know. If you want to do it, you can certainly uh, dare to bear just a touch. Well, Yasmin looks great. You don't have to have the crop top to do this look. You you definitely don't have to. Now, everyone from Gap to Chanel is doing this sort of look, and she pulls it off so well, but you don't have to. You can just have one fluid silhouette with the matching pieces, and I think you'll look really on trend. They're it's not matchy-matchy, matchy, though. They complement each other, but exactly. this horizontal versus vertical, is that the key? Yes, and so it's subtle, right? And it's an easy way to keep it looking really on trend and comfortable, too, right? Yeah. I think we can all put something in our wardrobe like that and, and look great at any summer barbecue. Yeah. The Yasmin looks beautiful. Yay. Thank you. Our next trend is white on white. Let's bring our model out. This is Heidi. We've seen this on Julianne Hough, Lupita yep. Nyong'o, Kim Kardashian West, head to toe white. It's so pretty. 
best for summer. I love it. It's just effortlessly chic. And the way to do this really is you want to play with little subtle accents, right? You can see she has a great crisp white button down and then adds texture with the skirt that has a sort of see-through element and a pop of color with her clutch, simple gold bangles. I love this look. It's and the round sunglasses, is that the new shape we're supposed to be wearing? It is such a shape. It is the most on-trend thing. And they're like easy and cool and also sort of a nod to the 70s vibe, which we'll see in one of the other looks coming up. I love it. Heidi, thank you so much. Our next trend is gingham. Now, all summer long, we see the guys in this here around the Today Show, but ladies <laughs> yes. love it too. Reese Witherspoon, Dakota Johnson, yes. Victoria Justice, and now our model Peyton. Well, so that's the thing. I mean, you would see gingham in menswear for as long as you can remember. And now, remember how plaid in the fall was such a trend? Yeah. So this is going to be your summer plaid, so to speak. It's easy. You can wear it as a skirt or a dress, as she's doing, but you could also just have a great button-down tucked into a pencil skirt or some some shorts and you're perfect for summer. It's um, it is not Dorothy from Wizard of Oz. No. It is much shaker these days. When we come back, TikToker Morgan Irwin shares her secrets for dressing just like Kate Middleton in a few inspired looks. <laughs> Welcome back. The royal family's fashion has inspired trends around the world for decades. But for one viral TikToker outside Baton Rouge, Louisiana, more than 4,600 miles from the palace here in London, it's the timelessness of Kate, Princess of Wales's fashion choices that draws her in. And she's gained her own royal size audience, showing women everywhere how to dress like a princess without having access to the privy purse. Here's Molly Hunter with more. Welcome to a series that I like to call Kate Middleton style on an Amazon budget. I don't know if y'all are the same, but I am obsessed with her. Social media style maven Morgan Freeman has always been drawn to the grace and elegance of the Princess of Wales. I vividly remember when they got engaged and she was wearing that navy blue dress. And I was 12 at the time. That's where it just like clicked for me. I was like, I have to dress like this woman. I want to carry myself like her. But it probably wasn't until these past two years that I got to the age where I was like, you know what, this is what I love. And now Kate's influence continues on one of the biggest days of Morgan's life. I'm getting married in September and I bought the first wedding dress that I tried on because I had a very distinct vision in my mind, um, Kate's wedding dress. Her love for Kate's style has ignited Morgan's own fashion following. I love it! I am actually so in love with this. With over 3 million likes on TikTok, where she reimagines the royal styles for less. I cannot get over this $29 dress. There are girls that are on the younger side that don't want to follow fast trends. Then there's women that are 60, 70 years old and they're like, thank you so much, you've saved my wardrobe. And I feel like I've created this really warm environment for women. I don't think y'all are ready for this. Star of the show, this maroon coat with the faux fur. I'm speechless. Let's put it on. The most viral look is definitely the maroon coat. It's a timeless piece that I feel like people can pull out around the holidays when it's cold year after year. When 
Kate comes out, it's like, I'm just waiting to see what she's wearing because I'm hopping on my phone to see if I can find something similar while saving people money. Her secret to creating a high-end royal look for less, it's pay attention to the details. Say a stripe doesn't align at the seam, to me that is like a big no-no. It just doesn't look cohesive. It doesn't look expensive. Um, another thing is like hardware and buttons on clothing. Even if it's a good silhouette, if there's a cheap button or a cheap zipper, I'm like staying away from that. I spend time, time, time digging. I've <laughs> regrettably spent probably hours of the night until 3 a.m. like scouring and like I know I can find trousers that look just like hers. I only share if I feel 100% confident like this is a good outfit to put into the world because I want people to be happy with what they're getting and feel good in that clothing. But it isn't just the princess's wardrobe that this royal watcher is drawn to. Kate embodies is kind of like a poised power. So I feel like through her clothing but then also just her her energy, it's like this lady seems so delicate and like royal, but at the same time, like so strong and bold. Morgan's crowning achievement, helping other women feel confident with wardrobes that may never go out of style. It like sparks this like childlike joy in me to put an outfit together. I love to feel that for myself, to feel so good in an outfit when you walk out the door, like, oh my gosh, like I feel like I'm on cloud nine right now because my outfit is so like banging. But doing that for other people is like tenfold. And there you have it, your primer on royal style. I hope we've answered all of your questions and you've learned a little something about how each fashion choice does more than meets the eye. We can't wait to see what the royal family wears next and we'll be following every step of the way. Thank you for joining me this half hour. I'm Keir Simmons. See you next time on Today or Day. When it's as hot as it's been this summer, the last thing you want to do is turn on an oven. Okay, here's the question. When was the last time you turned on your oven? It's been a while. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> so, we've got you a cool summer treat thanks to one of our favorites, Chef, Chef Alex Guanaschelli. She's the host of Food Network's Alex versus America. This woman can take on the entire country. country. Okay, and by the way, this month she'll be feeding hungry tennis fans at the U.S. Open and her yeah. restaurant fair. I'm going to come. Yeah, it's the perfect restaurant. It's open for 12 days and then it closes. It's ideal and it's super fun. The U.S. Open Ugh. is just the place oh, to be. Oh, I can't wait. It's I'm going with you. Oh, and I'm sorry. Oh. I'm just kidding. You can come <laughs> with me. Okay, tell us about this no-bake pie. We love it. You don't have to put it in the oven. No, you literally just layer stuff that's delicious. Now, we've got a homemade, uh, we've got a store-bought a graham cracker crust. Like you that. could use, you could make it homemade. Butter, no, graham no, crackers. No. Okay, good talk. You're going <laughs> to put a little bit of ground cinnamon and salt on the crust itself. Wow. on the crust. To give it a little extra flavor, Ooh, I right? I love this. Right? We're layering Ooh. the flavors in there. And then I have some peanut butter here. Okay. Mm. And I used crunchy. Now I you, like crunchy for now, some little texture, right? You do I you like, like a crunch. Salt. I do like crunch. Are you a smooth? I, you know what? A crunch in here. You know, I like a crunchy ice cream, a crunchy um, peanut butter on vanilla ice cream, which is what you're giving us. Yes. Yeah, so crunchy peanut butter. I added a little water. I saw just that. To, just to loosen the texture a little bit, because that's what we, that's what we like to do because around here. Because we need here. to smooth it. Yeah, we're smoothing. Do you want to smooth it? Smooth. Smooth. Yeah. I love it how you're like, please smooth. I know. We're now, a good team. Now, when, look at that. Look at this. You well, are. the cinnamon. Uh, no, oh, but boy. I, I can't. Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, um, yep. All right. Good talk. All right. I'm pretty. I'm pretty. I'm pretty. I'm so pretty. Here we okay. Are. okay. You look good. Look. So you put the layer of peanut butter in the freezer, right, to get it a little Frozen. firmed up. And then we put softened vanilla ice cream on so top here. So how soft does this need to be? It, it's all, You see how it's yeah, almost, almost liquidy? Melted. So you can leave it out while you're doing the other layers. And I mean, this, is, this. this is a so peanut butter fun. s'more vibe that we're going for. And then we sprinkle marshmallows on top. How fun is this? This is and amazing. And you can do this with the kids. A little brown sugar. By the way, brown sugar. I don't even yeah, know. I don't even know if the little... marshmallows would make it there because I would eat all of them. I know you are actually you're talking with a marshmallow in the most mm -hmm. brilliant way. Mm -hmm. Okay, we freeze that 
for a while. We let that firm up, and then what? Yeah, yeah. We're adding chocolate on top of this. Yeah, okay, and this then you do that. Now we add chocolate ice cream okay. on top there, and again, it's smooth. Yes. And by the way, you can do just vanilla or yeah. just chocolate. Oh, you can kind of sort of choose yes, what you want. Yes, absolutely. You can make this oh. easier and or use harder. Any type of ice cream, frankly. And, yeah, and then we we do a little more. We do some chocolate again. You notice we're always adding a little crunch, a little texture. Yes. And we yes. didn't turn on our oven, but we're turning on the charm here. You sure are, just by being you, Alex. And then some like marshmallows. Like someone who cooks without a measuring cup. That's what I love about you. There's yes. no measuring. It's I love just it. Go do you ever it. use a measuring cup? Yeah. I really actually do, but in a case like this, uh, it's like, I mean, oh, there was too much chocolate. Yeah. There was too much whipped cream. I hated it. <laughs> That's not going to happen. And then we layer that, that whipped cream on top, and you can put this right back in the freezer. And you know what? And I, and I wonder if you agree. I think it's worth whipping your own cream. You know what? I do, and I like to use unsweetened so that it kind of yeah, counters all the sweetness. And I see what you want to put on top, which is some sea salt. Yes, so and then more chocolate. I like to whip my own cream. Yeah, and you know what? You Please did don't it. be nasty. Sure, Jan. You Please did it. Don't you Jan. did it. Turn on the oven. You can whip your own cream, and then you have this all on top, and you pop it in the freezer, and then oh my God, look! It's oh magically too. I got me. this for you for your birthday. Thank you so Happy much. birthday! You better give me more than a pie. <laughs> I will. Don't worry. <laughs> this is amazing. The peanut butter is delicious. I love it. Alex, we love you, and you can get these recipes at today.com/food. Okay, if you're throwing a backyard barbecue this weekend, we've got a dessert you've got to try. It is an ice cold. No bake berry cream. Oh my gosh, pie. you had us at no bake. And you know it's good because Padma Lakshmi is here. She's making it. She's the host and executive producer of Bravo's <laughs> hit cooking competition series, Top Chef, which has been nominated for and you five have been nominated choice Amazing. awards. And yes, and the finale is tonight, so please watch. All the way, congratulations. Um, thank it must you. feel so good after this many seasons to still have that rush. It does. It feels yeah. good. And mm -hmm. also, Taste the Nation, my mm -hmm. other show, got nominated for a couple of Critics' Choice wow. Awards. Wow. So, yes. All right, let's and get, we, we got let's you get some champagne to celebrate the queen. Yay. Okay, so talk to us, Padma, okay, about so this. Okay, so today I'm going to teach you how to make a really, really easy cheers, cheers. Mm -hmm. um, mm. recipe for berry pie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jenna, I want you to just crush these okay. up. Okay. All you do is you take about a cup and a half, which is usually one of those packets of graham yep. cracker, yep. and you... Mm -hmm. Make them into crumbs like she's doing. Love it. Add some cube butter, about oh. six tablespoons. And how melty should that be? It shouldn't be that melty. It's just, just been sitting temp. out. Yeah. Because okay. you guys were joking with Michelle, who I love. She's like, hilarious. Like, she's so so you want to mix this. The easiest way is with your fingers, okay. to be honest. And you want to get it to look like that. Crumbly. Then I just you dump just it dump in. it all in. You don't have oh, to be so why precious. Am I doing that? And here precious. too, you're gonna pat. <laughs> Nobody's ever called her that before. In that dress, you look very precious. And you just want to smash this down yeah. to make it as flat as possible. Okay. And that's your graham cracker and, crust. And by the way, this. you can buy this too, but you Yes. Know. But do you? I do sometimes. Okay, cool. I do. Okay. When I'm on, like, the summer. Yeah. Like, summer you don't want to cook. No. And I'm not a big baker, so okay, that's why I love this dessert. Yeah. This is uh, vanilla ice cream that Yum. you're just leaving out. Yeah. And all you're going to do. This I mean, so we simple. can do this. Oh, my God. Yes, look at this. Don't do you want this. it? Yes, oh. I can do this. And then all you do here is just smooth this out. You can use an offset spatula. How long did you leave that out for? Like Probably 20 minutes. minutes yeah. Not even 30. Because okay. you don't want it to be so, too yeah. mushy. So that goes on there. And you, then you put the berries on. But come it. here. Let's go over here. Oh, and we're making minis. Yeah, okay. we're making minis. So These you guys, are cute for kids. I think oh, we yeah. should do this. Now, and the one tip it. I want to tell you. I know that in you know June is eating healthy right. month. So this oh, is, is done with ice cream. But when I do it at home, yeah. I do it with vanilla yogurt. Yeah. Okay. Or better yet, I do it with lassi, which is Indian drinkable yogurt. Wow. Drinkable? And I want to talk oh. about this because it is healthy. Yeah. Uh, Indian yogurt is cultured a different way. A billion and four, 1.4 billion people can't be wrong. Yeah. yeah. Like it's an ancient, ancient practice. Do you freeze it too? Can you, you can freeze it? You can freeze it, and I use it in this berry pie. It has 15. Uh, the brand that I like is The Delicious. I liked it so much I became an investor in this company. Amazing. It has 15 billion probiotics. Wow. It, it has the lowest sugar of any drinkable yogurt, and it's delicious. The reason I became involved in it is because they sent me some stuff, and as you can imagine, I get so much stuff sent. Yeah. 
yeah. me. Sure. I just put it in the fridge. My daughter and my nephews kept reaching for it. It was Brown gone beer. before I could try it the first round. Oh my they gosh. Sent it to me. Wow. And I was like, why is this so good? Because yeah. it tastes so decadent. It's just really does good. Does it taste so decadent? It does. I dare you to. Uh, we'll okay, send you some. Well, I would let's love taste to. this while we're here. Oh, yeah. Yes. Can we? Yes, please. Okay. please and do. I feel like you can use any type of ice cream for you this can, too, right? Like strawberry. And the one thing I want to mm -hmm. tell you, yeah, you can. The one thing I want to tell you, if you're serving this, mm. you just need to freeze mm. it for eight hours mm. and then slice it. And then any pie you have left mm. over, put it back in the freezer right away because it will melt. But this feels like an elegant dessert, but it's really just and ice easy cream. To serve. It's easy, and I frankly, you could just buy the crust, and it will take one second. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, you've just you've just, you, you've just you. given us Thanks, our Padma. idea for this mm. recipe. Go to slash food <laughs> It's time for today's food, and out of Dylan's birthday, we're making it's my birthday? dessert. It's your birthday. <laughs> we're making dessert using ingredients that you probably already have at home. And here to show us the self-proclaimed queen of easy peasy, Jessie Sheehan's here. She's racked up quite the following on TikTok, creating delectable desserts in no time. And now <laughs> so she's out with her new book. It's called Snackable Bakes. Jesse, good morning. Good the morning. TikTok morning. legend. Hello. 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 So because it's no here. baking. This is fantastic. This, this pie has no bake, and I'm going to get started right away. Let's okay. do it. This is an orange cream pie. It's a no bake oh. cream pie with a pretzel crust. Oh. The first thing we're going to do is make a pretzel crust. We've got our brown sugar. Mm -hmm. okay. We have some finely ground pretzels. We have a little bit of salt. I am a saltaholic. I'm just oh, going to. Yeah. So, so I, like, I do I like add the way you think. salt to pretzels, which is a little crazy. Okay. And I'm going to add some melted butter. All right. Oh. Was orange. And then I am butter. just going to. To pulse this together briefly, if it's I can get the chance. top on. There you go. For you, and you can take it to the next one. Ah, ah, okay, okay, it's on. Not happening. Yay! Yay. Now I want to show you this. This is a very technical tool, peeps. This is the bottom yes. of a measuring cup. Uh -huh. I am using this to Thank press you. in oh, the crust, nice. which is super, super cool. And I knew the crust was done, just so you guys know, when I could squeeze it in my hand. Oh. Now, once this is done, I'm putting this into the freezer while I make the filling. Go. Dun, da, 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 filling. Mm. The filling is, a, is this orange cream hey, that's filling. Good. Thank you. Oh, this is the pretzels like, are ridiculous. That's good, right? The salty sweet. Wow. Mm -hmm. Any so special I, kind of, uh, keep oh, going. Okay, I'm going to keep going. But in here, I have my cream mm. cheese. That's what's going to set my filling. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add some sugar. Powder I'm going to add, this is a crazy ingredient. What is that? Peeps, this is defrosted orange juice concentrate. Oh. Listen to this craziness. And this is a little lemon juice. Going to pop that orange. This is so good. I tried to make this, this pie with just orange juice because I thought that would be like, oh, natural. Right. Yeah, didn't didn't work, huh? Did not work. Okay. Not happening. So, but if you so add you the concentrate, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. Okay. Now, I would put this top on right now, we but I'm not going to okay. do it. So, so I'm going to keep it going. Right. Here we have some whipped cream. Believe it or not, peeps, I whipped the cream oh. in the food processor. This oh, entire wow. recipe in the food processor. I know that's weird, right? But you can you do could. it. And I'm going to add that filling right. to my whipped cream. Oh, my. So gorgeous. You can see the orange extract in there. Yeah. It gives it these beautiful little flakes of orange. Okay. Wow. Or should I say flex? Maybe I mean flex. 
flecks as opposed to flakes. I'm going to put it right into my crust. Mm -hmm. This, this is, is so so good. Oh my god, I love this you guys orange, you so really much. Taste the orange. All right, we got I one minute to, left, wow. I want to get okay. to going. Okay, let's go. This is going in the into the freezer. Okay. Perfect. Freezer. Here go. we go. Got also, it. just have to say, this is special whipped cream with melted marshmallows or fluff in it because it stabilizes the cream and it gives it great flavor. We're making Dylan's birthday cake. In here, we have flour, sugar, we have leavening, we have salt. We are adding some sprinkles. Next. Oh, and this cake is vegan, by the way. Really? This is a rainbow sprinkle birthday cake. The dressing as well? I mean, the dressing. The frosting? The frosting is not vegan, but I have a chocolate vegan glaze in my book that you could use. Now I'm adding the wet ingredients. You're seeing how fast this is coming together. It's crazy. This has a little bit of vinegar. It has water. It has oil. The vinegar and the soda play together to get the rise and to get the texture without any eggs or anything like that. Wow. This is our cake batter. This one we're going to bake. This oh one gosh, is going to go so right moist. in here. And thank God for Al. Look at him helping me. I love That's what that. we say every day. You do? Thank God for Al. I know, yeah. right? Yeah. I would. Amen. Wow. This is going to go into an oven for 45 minutes. And. Bam, bam. Voila. Voila. Easy peasy. Jesse, Jesse. You are so wow. welcome. Yeah. This was so right. fun. Thank you guys. Happy birthday. It's your first time on the so show. You were great. Yes, thank Correct. you. Her new Very book, good. it's called Snackable Bakes. It's out now. And to check out Jesse's recipes, it's today.com. Slash food. Well, of course, you know, it's Super Food Friday, so we're going to tackle those afternoon cravings. Mm. Today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is here showing us how not to, how to make not one, but two tasty snacks to curb after school or after work hunger. Or any time. Right, we're we're right. Right. <laughs> right now. We'd right love now. it right now. So, Joy, <laughs> you're starting with no-bake peanut butter granola bars. Mm. What goes in? Oh my gosh, guys, I am totally obsessed with these bars. I can't keep my hands out of them. They're sweet, they're salty, they're chewy, and I'm just saying they're good for kids one to 100. Ah. <laughs> this is two cups of whole grain oats. So we know once there's oats in there, one thing I love about these granola bars, you have control over what goes in mm -hmm. and what stays out. So these are good for lowering cholesterol. Um, they're good for evening out blood sugars. I'm adding in just a teaspoon of ground cinnamon and half a teaspoon of salt. That's it. So this is going to be our dry ingredients. Passing this down to Ian Bauer. <laughs> and it's all about the wet ingredients okay. now. So here, the star, our creamy peanut butter. So we know we have heart healthy fat. We've got some protein, some fiber. Instead of oil or butter, I'm adding in here just a third cup of natural unsweetened applesauce. Okay. Our sweetener will be a little bit of honey. Honey's going to give it sticking power. It almost acts as a glue mm. together with the peanut butter and vanilla extract. Mm. So that's our wet ingredients. I mix this together and then I'm going to add it in with our dry ingredients. I'm going to save some time. I would keep mixing. Um, you get a bit of Michelle Obama arms here, but it's going to be nice <laughs> and smooth. And I add oh, in. I'm like, is that all it my, <laughs> No, I'm, ju I'm just actually saying that I'm just, trying I'm to just get kidding. Michelle Obama. Just kidding. I'm just <laughs> kidding. Give it to you if you made these every day. There you go. <laughs> right. And so after you mix in your oat combination, I then just put in some chopped peanuts because I want a little bit of texture and also I want the goodness from the peanuts. And of course, you can swap in almond butter and almonds as well. Sure. And sometimes I'm just saying I'm known to put in some chocolate chips. Yeah, of course you can. <laughs> yeah. So this gets all mixed up and I'm going to show you what it looks like now. Ian's going to have Michelle it... Obama arms at this point. <laughs> I put it into a square baking mm. pan just like this, and I have parchment paper oh. underneath because you want to be able to easily lift it out, and then you slice right down the middle right. and then across seven times. I should say I stash this first in the freezer Got to it. firm. Oh, okay. And then oh, here so are the bars. They wow. are so and unbelievable. So and you keep them in the freezer. They don't freeze. They just firm up and they stay chewy. I have a great big batch that I sent to my youngest daughter in college, and she's already requesting more. Well, so we I want to get chocolate chip muffins. Of course we do. <laughs> so, so now we're doing um, chocolate banana muffins. So for the dry ingredients here, I have whole wheat flour, mm -hmm. and I'm mixing in plain unsweetened cocoa powder. Cocoa powder is so great for heart and brain health. A little bit of salt and a little bit of baking soda. So that's it. 
So these are our dry ingredients mm -hmm. right here. I'm making a little bit of a mess. And now for the wet ingredients, and this is where things get How many cutboards do you have? She has a bunch. <laughs> oh, Dylan, I have a lot. I have an entire big drawer filled with cutting boards. <laughs> I love my cutting boards. Some ladies like jewelry. I like cutting That's boards. Not <laughs> okay, so now I have mashed bananas. Ah. So again, instead of like the butter and the oil, I have three medium ripe mashed bananas, loads of potassium. I'm adding in a little bit of milk mm -hmm. and a little bit. The sweetener here will be maple syrup. Yum. And here I have two eggs. And again, I'm all about that vanilla extract. Too. And so I would mix this up. Yum. And then the wet ingredients again goes into the dry ingredients. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna load it up. So we I'm only have about 20 up. seconds left. Can we see the, the after? Oh, yes. Here we go. So we, we're going to bake it in the oven at 350 just for about 20 minutes. Okay. And I'm going to show you what they look like. And so you'll see some of them are lighter and some of them are darker. And that's because you have the option of omitting that cocoa powder and having a more banana bread yeah, forward tasting that. muffin. But they're so cute. And you could garnish with a lip before you put them in the oven, a little slice of banana. And that's it just really adds that special something. Joy, that is terrific. And thank you, Ian for us as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for these thank recipes, you so much. Head to today.com slash food. Have you do you cook in a hot kitchen? No, yes. no, but Siri does. It's hot. Yes. Okay. So how sweet is this? No baked dessert from Alex Guarnaschelli, the executive chef and owner of Butter Restaurant here in NYC. Alex, good <laughs> to see you. She's one of our favorites. You getting a little aggression? Out, I Alex? love that I look over and she's. Yeah. By the way, just because you're not baking doesn't mean you can't get a little workout in That's the kitchen. Right. You can That's break right. a sweat, but in a different way. You burn the calories before you eat them. So you're making a making? crust, right? I'm making a crust. Here are all the fantastic ingredients. Don't they look so fresh and yes. non-bakeable? <laughs> I just crushed up some uh, cookies. You can bake. You can bake homemade cookies. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. why do that when we can make? When we can just buy some store bought? You crush them with a rolling pin in a bag. Right. Would you open what the kind bag? Of cookies are these? Magic man. These are just straight butter cookies. Okay. They've got some spritzy cookie snickerdoodly notes. I love the tasting mm, that's going on. Goes in here. Yep, right in there. With th so wait, so this is the no baked cheesecake, right? Th this is the crust. Would you please stir? Sure. And I'm going to add some cheese and cookies uh, and, and, nuts. and and some toasted almonds. You could you could skip the nuts, by the way, if you wanted to. Okay. If you're not if you're not into not that. that person. You mix it in, and then what happens is we come over here and we just press it in. So I start by pressing this cream cheese and nut and cookie mix, and then check it out. Come yeah, on, you can do this. Press like that right in there. 
Yours Look at this. Better. I've got you guys. Now, we're not baking, but we're cooking. Look at this. I've got one on the crust and oh, one pressing good. it yeah. in. And using the bottom of that... Um, Measuring so this cup. is just nuts, the crushed cookies and the cream cheese. Yep, and you refrigerate that until it sets. You don't need to cook it, and it has no butter in it. You just did a great job, Carson. You know, so you I'm refrigerate you. this or, th or that? No, you this. refrigerate it like this, like this. to okay. let it firm up, and then we just literally paddle the, a little bit is more. Is that cream cheese? This is a pound of cream cheese. Mm -hmm. with just some like I like it, a pound. Fresh orange juice. You want to add this? Yeah, what is this? Condensed milk. So think of it kind of like a, a cousin of key lime pie. Yes. Wow. So we just got orange juice, cream cheese, and condensed milk. Look at you. you really a little baker I love at it. heart. No, it's fun. I love it. You guys sell this stuff? It, it, <laughs> butter? Or no. 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 Desserts? No, we, we bake away. Bake this away, is right? the I'm stuff I do at eat. home. So then that's this, right? Yep. Once it's just mixed together. And we just, go ahead. Look yep. how easy this is. You pour it in. Does it have to set for a little while? Yeah, you put it in the fridge mm. and you let it set for a while. And then for the sauce... Little orange juice again, water. I like to repeat the same ingredients. So it's like not, it's healthy. Yep. I it, think it's healthy. It's very healthy. It's mm -hmm. a little bit caloric, <laughs> but it's very healthy. And then jam with fresh fruit is always a great thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I would do? So we just pulse I would this put, up. I'd put some limoncello in this somehow. You could. Oh, and then could you? This like is actually. Is it to no bake, you mean? This is even easier. This store is bought ice cream pie? Store bought a fresh bought crust. Oh right? my God, it's great. You drop the softened ice cream. Oh I God, chose why would you strawberry. Ever bake you do not need to bake. This is softened strawberry ice cream in a store-bought crust. Mm. We mix it together mm. with jam and strawberries. We freeze this pie up, and you could use, I mean, literally this is ice you cream and up? pie. Freeze it up, strawberries and topping. jam topped on top. Delicious. Check this out. When Delicious. it firms up, it oh looks gosh. like this, right? Mm. Couple strawberries on top. Come on, baby. What's the Palage. drizzle? Can you drizzle me? Oh, drizzle. Is, is that balsamic? Like never balsamic asked. right balsamic. on top. Balsamic. Oh, I can smell that. Alex. You did it again. This Ooh. is delicious. It's so easy, really. Thank you so much. Okay, so for these out. recipes, in head today.com slash food. She's here this morning on Today Food. Our friend Samadada is back to show us two easy recipes to close out summer. And in this heat, the best part is there's no cooking yeah. involved. No cooking Good morning. I, like I always Hi, see you on Instagram. Hi, I'm so happy you're you're back and, and cooking for us because your food so looks so be delicious all the time. I'm so happy to be here. I want to always create really easy, healthy recipes. Mm -hmm. No ovens required yes. here. That's so great. they're perfect for the end of summer. This looks yummy. What is this? So this is my chilled chickpea salad. Super easy to make. Mm -hmm. I love recipes where you just kind of throw everything in one bowl, mix yeah. it up, lots of flavors, lots of textures. So we're going to start with some diced cucumbers, okay? Mm -hmm. So we can just go ahead and dice it. I know we're on TV, so I'm going to just do my little, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. That. What do you mean? Dylan's like a Dylan, pro. You wanna, you wanna I'll dice it while you talk, yes. I'll Dylan's a pro. Also, you call them chickpeas. Is there, is there a difference between, between the chickpea and the garbanzo bean, or is that the same? It's the same thing. Okay. It's All the right. same thing. And you know what? I am not above a canned chickpea. Okay. Oh, I love a canned chickpea. Do you rinse them? first? You do. So for this recipe,
must be definitely rinse and drain them, but okay. they're easy, they're accessible, they're yeah, affordable. You can find them. So, wow, beautiful. Thank you, Dylan. Great job, Okay, great. So we've got our uh, diced tomatoes already in here. Okay. So we're going to do that. Good, we're going to add our... Dicing tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, we're not, I'm wearing all white. Yeah. Not a good choice. <laughs> Dump that Cucumbers in. Cucumbers in there. We've got some diced red onions. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go in with my chickpeas, again, drained and rinsed. Drained and rinsed. Right in there. Does it matter what kind of tomato you use, Summer? You know, I would actually prefer for you to use a really nice ripe tomato. Okay. If it's in season, even better. Okay. But okay. you can use grape tomato, cherry tomato, okay. whatever get to calls these. to you. Okay. Little okay, great. So we're going to add try. some lime juice. Dylan, I'm going to make you just okay. do that because yes. you're a pro. Just, just put me to work. <laughs> there you go. Right. And then now, this is my favorite thing. Mm. After we add some lime juice, some olive oil. Mm. We're gonna add some okay. chopped masala. Oh, so chopped masala is a spice blend oh. that's really common in Indian street food. Yes. It's delicious. It's got cumin, coriander. So that's what takes it up. I powder. was just about to say, I didn't see yeah. that coming. Yeah, it's a Ooh, little that tangy, is that a little is savory. Fantastic. Where can we get that? Salt. You can get it online. Honestly, the internet chopped is our masala. BFF. You know this what I'm is saying? great, she actually sends some to us. Salt. And it's healthy too, right? Very healthy and oh, look wow. like it's packed with protein. It's got lots of veggies, Is that cilantro? texture. That's cilantro. Mm. Little salt, a little mm. freshly little ground black pepper. Oil? And this is olive oil. Really simple. Girl, this really is easy amazing. to make. Cold I'm so glad you like fresh. it. This it's is amazing. chilled. It's refreshing. Mm -hmm. We love it. And that so gives a little spice. Too, a little right? spice, a little kick. Okay. And now another really easy no bake recipe. Okay. I love carrot cake, but sometimes I just don't want to turn my oven on. Right. You know what I mean? I don't blame you. So these have become my new carrot cake best friend. Okay. So first we're gonna grate some carrots. By Done. the way, everything comes together in a blender. Okay. So you can grate your carrots using a box grater. We've got some unsweetened shredded coconut in here. Coconut. Add our carrots. If you got, you guys follow me on Instagram, you know I don't you stop love, talking about dates. Yeah, I like you know. it's all you I always love like dates. Dates. It's, date it's like all I talk about. It's yeah. getting not normal. All right, let's um, go. Dates in there. We've Just got make some. Make sure you get that pit out before you oh, put it in there. Please pit them. I've ruined a recipe with <laughs> a couple. Definitely date pit pits. them. I'm using yeah. medjool dates, which are really sweet. They've got a nice juicy sure. flush. Some cashews for that really nice buttery base. And then all of the usual suspects with carrot cake. Mm -hmm. We've got some cinnamon, some ground ginger, some salt. Think healthy. Vanilla extract. Mm -hmm. And then what I like to do, it's kind of fun to get your kids involved as well. You okay. get this dough, blend it until it's nice and pulverized. Hey. And now what? <laughs> that's, be that's, that's much better than shocked. I was expecting. I do like it, you Sam. Sound I am. Surprised. <laughs> that is much I better than I was like <laughs> The actual shock on Craig's face right now. Yeah, well, Make them into shot. little bites. Wait, and it roll it. Like cake. And so you know what I like to do? Get some nice like mixed okay. salted nuts. Mm -hmm. You can use your favorite. I'm using pistachios and pecans mm -hmm. here, but use your fave. And then you can just roll it in the nuts. This so gives a nice little like oh, wow. sweet and salty mm -hmm. situation. You know, mm -hmm. I love Absolutely. a little sweet and salty. No bake. The kids would super easy to make. Really, really love it. It's really delicious. It's also mm. fun to get the kids involved with making it, Just right? Because so it's very hands on. Sama is like my girl crush and my inspiration, <laughs> even though she's like young enough to be my child. Stop. Like when I first met her, she worked for NBC and she was like glowing. And you know me, I went up to her, I'm like, what do you do? Like, what, she how do you look like this? Water every day. And then she started introducing us to her cooking. We're like, this is why she is right. so glowy. Aww. No meat. I love oh, it. Yeah. She said, also kind of tastes like oatmeal cookie dough. Oh my God. It does. It's right? a definite cookie dough vibe, yes. right? So because good. it's really chewy. It's Good morning, welcome to The Boost. Today we are celebrating people who are changing the game, blazing trails, and redefining rules. So, we start with a new trend that has single moms coming together in a new way and expanding the definition of family. Our good friend Maria Shriver has the story. The number of single mothers in this country is on a steady rise. And while the U.S. has the highest rate of children living in single-parent households, Americans are also much less likely to live in extended families than anywhere else in the world. A reality that has some parents and their children looking for other options. We knew that we would be happier no matter what happened if we all combined. It just was such a good opportunity that there was no reason not to. It was four years ago that Kim Neff came to her kids, Samantha and Jackson, with an idea. The same one that Crystal Terry presented to her son, Shane. I remember the day my mom told me. I was instantly excited. The two moms met when their boys were in the same first grade class and years later went through separations and divorces around the same time. In 2019, they decided they would be better off living together. You thought, okay, so this will be better for us financially. Right. We can share the rent, share mm -hmm. the utilities, share the groceries. Right. You yes. can help with childcare. Mm -hmm. I'm at the office, you're at home. Did you think of it also as emotional support? 
well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, but I didn't, I didn't realize that would be such a big benefit of it um, mm -hmm. until we moved in together. There's another adult here that understands what I'm facing, what I'm going through. Like the component that you have in a marriage, but without the romantic piece yeah. of it, yeah. um, has been huge. We live on a momium by the lake. The term momune has become a popular way to describe two or more moms living together with their children. A newer hashtag, but not a new concept. After I divorced out of a 17-year marriage, uh -huh. okay, I was suddenly raising my son on my own, and it didn't feel right. Like, you know, where's my tribe? 22 years ago, Carmel Boss decided to interview other single mothers with the hope of finding another family to share her home. I found somebody with my own you know, priorities and philosophy, and uh, but then these other 17 all wanted to do the same thing, you know? And I had this list, and I thought, one's got a three-year-old, one's got a four-year-old, they live in the same neighborhood, I'm just gonna call them back and introduce them to each other. Once you found your own match, yeah. you started matching other people you'd had interviewed with one another. Yeah. Soon after, Carmel founded Coabode, an organization that matches single mothers who want to share a home or support each other in other ways. And she says traffic to the website is skyrocketing. So this is in a way an old fashioned village concept, really, from yeah. the back of time, but it seems to be taking on more urgency or more popularity right now. Why do you think that is? I think the two pain points that it resolves, the economic struggles that people are having, and then just um, the emotional, the disconnection that occurred in the last three years in particular. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 80 percent of single parent families in the U.S. are headed by single mothers, and 23 percent of them live below the poverty line. Without this living arrangement, Kim and Crystal say their lives would look very different. I wouldn't be building for any kind of future if I was trying to pull this off on my own. It would be a paycheck to paycheck circumstance. How do you implement boundaries or do you? Do you say like, okay, this is my family and this is my family and this is my space and my space. We talk about that all the time, that there, this is our space. Yeah. It's not your space, your space, it's our space. Yeah. And it works for us, I love it. A shared space and a true village. We're a family of five and like that is so cool. As we continue our celebration of family, let's meet four women who have formed a unique sisterhood and support system. They're creating a new kind of family and sharing how they hope to help other women. Chanel Jones has their story. At any given moment, I have people I can talk to, laugh with. We do a lot of laughing. Karen Hopper, Leandra Nicola, Holly Harper, and Jen Jacobs all say they found their dream home here in Tacoma Park, Maryland. But for them, it's not just about location, it's about living together, kids and all. They go out and practice their flips on the trampoline, and it's just the most fun. The idea for this full house came from Holly and Heron, close friends who went through divorces at the same time. Holly and I really just said, why not? We yeah. were in individual apartments. We were kind of tired of paying rent and yeah. dealing with the logistics of being single parents. My marriage ended and then I had a like, couple of really significant losses. And then in early 2020, my dad died. Just like my life was burned to the ground. Yeah. And so I could turn to Heron and say, we ha I, have, I literally have nothing left. Let's just yeah. do this. They started searching, finding the perfect house on day one and closing in June of 2020. They just needed more people to share it with. I posted in the neighborhood listserv, hey, two single moms bought this house. You know, we have a basement unit for rent. Leandra messaged right away and said, I want in. Leandra, tell me about that decision then. Part of just trying to find a way to like have a stable place to live as a single mom and then had all the perks of like this amazing built-in support system. <laughs> then Holly and Heron's friend Jen also moved in. The pandemic had been what six months into it and I was just not feeling in a good place and just feeling really cut off and then finally in October of 2020 that was my decision like I, I gotta get out. So how is the place set up? Do you each have your own kitchen and bathrooms? It's a four unit building um, so there's a front door and from there you access directly sort of Holly's unit upstairs is mine and then on top of mine is Jen's 
and then you can go to the basement and access Leandra's. The four split the cost of household expenses and hold monthly meetings to talk business or about any conflicts, which they say are rare. This is probably a loaded question, but for, for those of us who are married, we're like, oh, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'll joke with my husband that I need a wife. Like, you know, yeah, I need somebody well, to like, help me. do? Like, I just need, Come you know, on. <laughs> The simplest example is every Monday night is garbage night yeah. and only probably once a month yeah. do I do it because someone yeah. else has done yeah. it. And it's yeah. like, oh my God, I live with women. <laughs> <laughs> well, they say it takes a village and you guys actually have created your own village, right? I hang out with their children and they'll hang out with mine. I can just say, hey, I'm going to go for a run. And there's always a grown up mm -hmm. on yes. site. They've even given their home a name. Siren House, after the mythical female creature. Siren is a form of sort of feminist power. We're building a community that we sort of have the siren song, so we bring people together. Case in point, Leandra and Jen. They fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> and now they're together. It's, it's true. Wait, is this for real? Like, seriously? Yeah. Yes. So uh, one night they, I was no, hanging no, out. No, 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 I was just saying one night. Can I go on the record and please have the movie rights to this true life? <laughs> Not only that, the women also helped Leandra open a cafe nearby called Main Street Pearl. To be in a place where you can like really trust the people around you who are gonna always have you, it's like that's, I mean, that is something that I didn't know I could ever have, so. Is there anything you want people to know about what you've learned from this experience? You can do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> Burn the rule book of life and just Look at it differently. I love that you guys are living fearlessly. I think that the big takeaway for me is that there is sort of unconditional love. I could be my worst self, I could be my best self. They see me for who I am and it's all okay. Coming up, a social media star using his passion to spread joy. Stay with us. the boost. Have you heard of train spotting? No, not the movie. And literally, you go outside and you spot trains. It's one man's passion for this pastime that has made him a viral sensation. Keir Simmons has the story. One look at Francis Bourgeois' social media accounts and you can see he likes trains. Please, please honk. Yes! Actually, he's loved them all his life. This platform here was where, from age zero to age six, I absorbed the uh, surrounding sounds and sights and formed my passion, basically, for the railway. A passion that still hasn't reached the end of the line. Oh, brilliant! There goes one now. Yeah. Does that get you excited when you see that? If I close my eyes, I could listen to it and I could tell you what it is. Are you serious? Yeah. It's kind of the same as, you know, a, a trained musician. If you say, oh, what's this sound? Oh, it's a flute. Oh, what's this sound? Oh, it's a sax. Obsession with trains is quintessentially British. 
Britain was the first country to produce a train. 23-year-old Francis Bourgeois is known in the UK as a train spotter. He even uses a head-mounted camera to record his emotions, especially to trains that signal him as they pass. For me, it's about the, the feeling that it gives me. I'm looking for a fix. I'm looking for that exhilaration. He's even been train spotting with Joe Jonas. Oh, what? Oh my God. Whoa! <laughs> oh my God. And met William and Kate. Well, I was sitting down and I went hi, and then Kate thought I went hi and like go shake her hand. I broke so many protocols. And as we filmed, his fans wanted their own pictures. <laughs> The thing is, train spotting was not cool in Britain, not even close, not until Francis changed that conception. There was a kid that came up to me and he said, um, thank you so much because I'm no longer bullied at school anymore. And he looked at me and he went, and I, and I looked at him and I started crying and I gave him a hug. And I looked around and other people on the train were crying. You know, in a way I've kind of helped my younger self, you know. Together, we went train spotting. Oh look, what's that? That's a class 08 shunter with a 92. That's really nice. Train spotting actually takes a lot of commitment. I've done sort of 14, 16 hours before. For a day? Yeah. Wow. Because you often have to wait for the train you want to see. But finally, we were ready for a unique experience, wearing Francis's trademark 360 head cameras. Am I allowed to say I feel a little bit silly? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> Turns out train spotting has some pretty strict rules. Yeah. Only wave with one hand and not too much. Just like a hello, like that. And that it's a roller coaster of emotion. All right, here it comes. Oh, it's properly going for it. Really? <laughs> Cheers! <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> there we go. For Francis, who's even written a book, having his passion accepted is the greatest high of all. You're part of letting people know yeah. that it's okay. To... <laughs> <laughs> letting people know that it's okay to be different. Ideally, everyone should be accepting of one another, especially in schools. I'd, I'd like there to be a change in awareness that people who are different should be accepted and even celebrated. And we've got another story for you. It'll lift your spirits. Take a look. Does everybody have a ball? Yeah. yeah. At Cleveland's Citizens Academy Southeast School, get in a circle. Get these a kids are learning to love basketball. Call me Coach Ryan, though, because he's Coach Russell. I like to teach kids, I like to inspire kids. You go on the left side, right? Inspired by this dynamic coaching duo. My name is Coach Rasul, Mr. Rasul. What's your favorite part about being a coach? My favorite part about being a coach is inspiring other people to do, to pursue their dreams. This is the side line. That's 10-year-old Ryan Rasul, alongside his dad, Harold. Everybody get a partner. The fifth grader leading a new program he helped create called Little Hands. It's your left hand. The goal? Ready. Go. Teach kids hand-eye coordination while building teamwork and trust. We're going to face each other now. Turn but for Ryan, this mission is about so much more than the game. It's a chance to give back after surviving three surgeries for a rare type of brain cancer. Do you think, Ryan, that, you know, your story of survival is a driving force behind what you do at Little Hands? It's definitely a driving force, and I have to be on my best behavior at all times so I can be a good leader and that the kids will look up to me. It's no surprise Ryan's love of the sport runs deep. Dad played ball in college and now coaches teens at Trinity High near Cleveland. What does it mean to you, Harold, to have Ryan be following in your footsteps? It means a lot. So now I think he's really understanding like his value. Like, wow, okay, I can really help these kindergartners or these first graders or these second graders. What does it mean to you for, to see how big their smiles are? 
I mean, it's heartwarming. Every time I feel discouraged or if I feel angry, I just think about those kids that are looking up to me. This father and son setting an example. Set, go. Helping young players succeed both on and off the court. I'm going to say one, two, three. We're going to say our chant, little hands, all right? One, two, three. Little hands. Coming up, we're trying our hand at some new skills. Stay with us. Back to the boost. This morning we are trying new things. Our pal Jacob Soboroff grabbed a paddle for a wet and wild adventure and he didn't have to leave beautiful Los Angeles to do it. Take a look. Three miles from downtown Los Angeles in the middle of the most populous county in the United States of America. Right. But if you just turned around and looked this way, You'd have no idea. That is the thing about this. It's the reason I love it. Steve Appleton is the head of a nonprofit called LA River Kayak Safari, teaching urbanites how to connect with nature. Let me tell you, the workout is intense, <laughs> dude. This is do this deal. twice a day with 14 people. Decades ago, this waterway was transformed from an actual river into a concrete flood control channel designed to prevent winter rainstorms from damaging surrounding neighborhoods. Then after decades of campaigning by local activists in 2012, it was officially declared a river again and efforts were made to restore habitat and wildlife. Now in the summer months, it's legal to kayak parts of the water, including this stretch that flows not far from my house. And I had to try it. You dedicate a lot of your time to bringing people down here and putting them in the river. Why do you do that? It's a bit of a coach thing. Yeah, You're the coach of the LA River. Yeah, it's a kind of coaching position. <laughs> so coach me, what, what should I expect today? We're in this urban oasis. Yeah, yeah. But this is not just a slow paddle down a pond. There's a couple little drops. We'd call them mild rapids. Wait, let me just get this clear. You said there are gonna be some rapids? Oh yeah, we're gonna get a little splash. No question about it. There's a few things I, I may wanna show you with the paddle. Steve agreed to take me and teach me the ways of urban paddling. If I rudder on the right, it's gonna turn me right. Push, yeah. And if I rudder on the left, it's gonna turn me left. If you push, it really does I a see. tight turn. Okay. So putting it all together, you know, you're paddling like this. I know I'm not gonna hear the end of this from our beautiful <laughs> television audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the hip action may not be necessary, <laughs> okay, no, but it's very stylish. Well, I well, appreciate honest, it, man. It's honest good. assessment, yeah. <laughs> no hip thrusting. And then it was time to hit the river. Here we go. Pray for me. Oh, this is a dream come true. I cannot tell you how long I have been waiting to do this. And you said stay close to the rocks, right? All right, here I go. Oh my God, this is crazy. Oh my God. Oh my 
my god! That was amazing! Wow, that was so fun! I knew I was gonna get wet. I didn't know I was gonna get wet that quickly. It's funny because as clean as I know the water is, having a butt full of LA River water, it's like you just think, what? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I had that moment years ago. I'm long past it. Exactly. <laughs> it's like nothing a good shower can't fix. Yeah, exactly. Soon enough, we were a couple miles downriver. The LA River is a series of juxtapositions nature versus the urban landscape. Hey, guys! Coming down. How fun. Oh, I see where you're going. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. That one, I didn't get stuck. Yeah. Lots of tossing and turning. Oh, yeah, how you like me now, Steve? Woo -hoo -hoo. Yeah. And then the trip was over. We got out of the river with downtown LA just over the next hill. It's a transformative experience for somebody who lives in LA. You're in another world. It's another world. It's another That's world. what it is. And in the shadow of the uh, in the shadow of the 110 freeway. I can't thank you enough. It was honestly Dude, it was one great. of the coolest things. Wonderful. Bucket list. Now let's take you behind the scenes of a New York City restaurant making culinary magic. And our very own Carson Daly even got in on the action in the kitchen. Take a look. Today I'm going to take you inside exclusive access to a place where two powerhouse female chefs are absolutely killing it and they're doing it with the help of a nearly 100 year old oven. This is Raf's. Come on in. Baby, tell me why. Executive chef Mary Atia and executive pastry chef Kamari Mick worked so well together at the famed Michelin starred Musket Room restaurant, they teamed up again with Raps. How did your guys' sort of relationship in the kitchen work? It was just the two of us. We would be listening to true crime and Broadway, and we just bonded outside of food. You guys bonded over true crime. We, and <laughs> yes. Bread, Broadway, <laughs> and true crime. And true crime. Raffs serves up French-Italian cuisine and fresh-baked goods in a location with a rich history. Even brick ovens called hearths from the 30s are still used today. They put these ovens in the back that we have running now. These same ovens that are same here? Same ovens, yeah. I've almost, been here almost 100 years? Yeah. Yeah, what it's makes incredible. It? Knowing that the hearth was the heartbeat of the neighborhood, they were here making bread. We wanted that to be the first thing people saw when they walked in the restaurant. The chefs co-owned Raffs. They partnered with the owners of the Musket Room, twin sisters Jennifer and Nicole. Raffs is named after their grandmother, Raffaella. The sort of you know empowerment that's happening with women in this space, you know, not just your partners that are sisters, but elevating women, that's a really cool part of this story. The example we set for younger women wanting to do this and, and see that we can be successful. I'm a girl dad, I, mean, I got three yeah, girls. We, you can do anything. Made fresh today, yes, perfect, I can tell. Perfect. Fresh out of the oven. God, that's good. <laughs> what are we gonna eat today? Because you work on a morning show, I've brought you out a candied orange almond croissant. That looks too good to eat. <laughs> oh wow. Not too orangey. That's delicious. French ham, jambon de bayonne. So it's one of our popular dinner time snacks. The meal. Oh my god, that's crazy. Yeah, right. well, I could eat this for breakfast, lunch, right. or dinner. Yeah. <laughs> this is our spinchone. On the bottom, as you can see, this crispy, nice crust is our house made focaccia. It's a Sicilian pizza, more okay. or less. And we believe they were probably cooking these in the heart 100 oh, years ago. So a little bit of homage. Yeah. yeah. They lost their flour. You need another log in the fire, chef? I love it's behind you. <laughs> And your spidey senses tell you that the 1935 oven is down a lot. Mm. Well, can we cook something together? We will. We'll let you by the fire. We're going to show you the spinchone. Yes. Let's do this. So Mine's we'll not finish. so bad. No, I think. James Beard nominee. I, I think you're actually hired. That thing is huge in there. Oh yeah, it goes 14, goes 14 feet back. 14 feet back. 
So then we do one more layer of cheese. Okay. You look like practice boxing in here. Yeah, we, we can only hire shorter people. <laughs> hey, it's a beauty. Can I get You're a doggy hired. bag, please? Keys. All right, on to my croissants. All right, we got a croissant. A croissant. No? No. No, good job, good job. Ooh la la. Roll like the wind. How are you with piping bags? Ooh, you might have exploded my new fly zone. <laughs> so I've we... never done a piping bag in my life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. C'est magnifique. Cheers. Cheers. Wow. Oh. Hmm. Appreciate it. This is incredible. Of course. I guess we're here. Come back Thank soon. the boost we have one more video for you today and it will make you smile check it out so there's a guy named Harvey he was on his first ever Southwest Airlines flight so he told the crew that he's always wanted to be a flight attendant so halfway through the flight they brought Harvey up to the front of the plane <laughs> and they made him an honorary flight attendant instantly he was a huge hit with passengers and you want to know why oh. take a listen okay listen up <laughs> Things are going to change around here, okay? <laughs> We're going to have free drinks for everyone. That's We're going to have all the meals. Yeah. We're going to have free baggage for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> On the serious note, how wonderful and how fabulous is this crew? Yeah. They give us where we need to go, when we need to go, and how we need to go. And have a good time. Watch out. <laughs> Watch oh. All right, Harvey. Harvey. Look. Wait, look at him. Brilliant. All right, so they didn't get the drinks and the meal, but uh, the free baggage was part of it, however. Uh, it was Harvey's first time on Southwest. He promised okay, it won't be his last, so this is a guy who checks bucket list items off his list. Well, way to go, Harvey. Harvey. Yeah. That is it for today. We hope we were able to start your day off with a little positivity, and we want to see you tomorrow with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day. Thanks for joining us on Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Wynn. Learn how to sell your home quicker at asking price, if not higher. Reduce your energy bill. And why you need to think twice about giving out your email. It's all coming your way. But first, a warning about a potential danger for drivers and pedestrians. Ultra bright headlights that can lead to accidents. And what you need to do now to stay safe on the road. Social media is filled with photos and videos of blinding headlights. I can't even see. I'm like literally getting blinded from the guy's headlights behind me. Watch these close calls apparently caused by the glare. This driver barely misses that pedestrian. Another near collision with an oncoming car and this crash into a down tree. The light does look much brighter. John Bolo is a scientist who studies lighting for the Mount Sinai School of Medicine's Light and Health Research Center. He says older headlights use halogen bulbs, which have a softer orange color, but newer ones 
are bluish white. You're creating a lot of glare for those other drivers. And a potentially dangerous situation. That's right. Bulla showed us the difference firsthand with an older halogen headlamp and a newer LED, both emitting the same amount of light. I'm going to look at the warm light just to kind of get a sense. Okay, yeah, it's bright. Let me see what the LED light does. Oh, this one for sure. Much, much brighter. It hurts my eyes and actually I'm still seeing the spots from it. Why is it that they appear brighter? Well, our eyes are more sensitive to blue light. He says the issue is magnified when a headlight is out of alignment, a common problem. An NBC News analysis found only 10 states require annual inspections that check to see that headlights are aligned correctly, pointing straight out and down. Bulla shifts an LED headlight out of alignment by just a few degrees to show me what can happen on the road. Wow, so the LEDs are already quite bright, but when they're tilted up, you can't see anything else. This would be very dangerous if I were driving. He says another contributing factor, large trucks and SUVs, which made up 75% of all vehicle sales last year. Those taller vehicles mean headlights are higher and more likely to shine directly into the eyes of a driver in a smaller, lower vehicle. I couldn't see for five to ten seconds. Aaron Madrid totaled his Chevy Sonic in November when he says an oncoming pickup truck blinded him. By the time I was able to see, I had swerved into incoming traffic and then I ended up in a tree. Fortunately, he wasn't hurt. It just felt like lights out. But Ashanti Collins wasn't so lucky. She says in May 2021, the lights from an oncoming vehicle led to her crash. Was it just totally blinding? Yes, I couldn't see anything. That was the only thing I seen before I woke up on the side of the road in my car. She had to be airlifted to a hospital to treat a broken arm and dislocated wrist. When you looked at the pictures of your car, did you think it was a miracle that you survived that crash? Yes, definitely. Looking at the car, it was just insane. Experts and automakers agree the primary solution to this glaring problem is something called adaptive headlight technology. Right now, it's only available on test vehicles here in the U.S., but I'm going to show you how it works. I'm here in Virginia at the Audi U.S. headquarters to show you what the future of driving at night might look like. Audi's head of product management, Philip Brabeck, what did these lights do? Well, instead of thinking of a static light like a low beam and a high beam, think of it as a projector. There's 1.3 million micro mirrors in each headlight that create this image. And it's not blinding other people. And it's not blinding other people. I get behind the wheel to see for myself. Wow, I can see yep. everything. <laughs> this experience of driving at night is completely different and so much better. I feel like a safer driver. Notice these arrows on the pavement. It's helping you stay within the lanes. As I pull onto the highway, the lights highlight my lane without affecting other drivers. Okay, so this so car- So now he got in. Got in front of me. And notice how it's got a shadow on him now. Yeah. Oh, interesting. But the real light show takes place on this dark, windy road. It almost feels like magic because of the amount of light that is being cast all over. I'm not used to seeing that as a driver. I switch cars so I can see what it's like to drive toward the test car with adaptive headlights. His high beams are on. Yes. But they're but not a problem not. for yep. me. Yep. Whereas this car behind him with the LEDs is quite bright. Yes. It's remarkable to see the difference. Do you think this technology is life-saving? Absolutely. Adaptive headlights have been in use in Europe and several other countries for about a decade now, but automakers and safety experts here say red tape in the United States means it could be years before we see this technology allowed on cars here. So in the meantime, you want to drive slowly at night, look toward the right hand edge of the road to avoid glaring lights. And if you suspect your headlights are out of alignment, you can actually check to see if one light is higher than the other when you pull into your garage or point your car towards a wall. Even an inch or two can mean a major misalignment 100 feet down the road. And don't forget to check with your mechanic. They should be able to easily realign your headlights. It's not just road safety that's become a hot topic. Retailers have also started tightening their refund policies and charging additional fees. This is all according to the National Retail Federation. Americans returned $816 billion worth of merchandise in 2022. So how do we avoid those extra fees? Here's how you can make your returns easier and cheaper. 
So, Vicki, it used to be when you bought something online, you didn't like it, it was a simple, easy return. But is that not the case so much anymore? Things are definitely changing, Hoda. Once upon a time, when we were nervous about going yeah. online to buy something, what is this, the internet shopping? Yeah. Retailers were like, look, we're going to make it so easy for you. We're going to ship it to you for free. You can return it to yeah. us for no yeah. fee. It'll be just like going to a brick and mortar. Fast forward 15, 20 years, and yeah. now we are doing that gangbusters. But it's not free to the retailer when you process a return. It's anywhere from right. 15 to $20 minimum. And we talk about 16 and a half percent of all online purchases go back and there's Jeez. a real cost. And now retailers are trying to claw that back. A recent survey by GoTRG shows 60% of retailers are reconfiguring their return policies in one way or another. Oh. It did almost feel like they, they did want you to yes. like, go yeah. try it on at home, send Absolutely. it back. Sure. No problem. Well, times they are a change in. So what are some of the new rules and pitfalls yeah. we should work out? Okay. For? P B P. It's oh, not a thing. I, I admit to you, it? I am making this up. Pause before purchasing. Yes. Oh. The less you buy, the less you're going to return. This is a good time, though, to check your favorite retailer's return policies because odds are something may have changed. And then when you get that item, if you're not positive you want it, Make sure you keep it in original packaging. Try it on without makeup or perfume on mm. because if you return mm. it, it needs to be in sellable condition. So much of these returns ends up in a landfill. So oh. it's wasteful. Even if you oh. get your money back, it's very wasteful. And there's a cost to the environment, all that shipping, that carbon footprint of sending you something, That's you boxing point. it up, sending it back. So those are things you need to keep in mind. And if you go to return in store, always bring your ID and your original form of payment. That just helps to expedite the Somebody return. Somebody said wait one. Someone said wait one week. If you're going to buy something online that's not urgent. Yeah. Yes. If you look back in your little basket and it's a week later and yeah. it's still there and you need it, then get it. Sometimes but you I get a discount too. Yes, yeah. Right. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you get a coupon I listen to you, Nikki. Yes. I listen I to it. you. Uh -huh. So let's look at the policies of some of the country's largest stores. Okay, let's start with Target. Target allows you 90 days to return almost anything except for electronics. Then it's 30 days. But if you have a Target red card, you have up to 120 days to return. Now, Amazon is the interesting one. It's always mm. been 30 days, free returns, as easy as possible. But you do want to pay attention because there are so many third-party sellers on Amazon yeah. and sometimes their return policies are different. Oh. Also, they're starting to implement, according to the information, a $1 return fee. So if you go to UPS to return something to Amazon, yeah. but there's a Kohl's or a Whole Foods that's closer to you, they will charge you a dollar on that item to return. And finally, Walmart, it's 90 days. In person, uh, in store, same, they have a shorter return window for electronics. But those are the big, big companies and their policies as of now. What about like Nordstrom always had like the best return? You don't like it, you take it back. Do retailers have their own things too? Definitely. Yeah. For example, Zara, $3.95 to return an item. Uh, JCPenney, $8. But if you go to the brick and mortar, as with most retailers, mm. it's usually free mm. if you're not shipping it back to them. Uh, the other thing is loyalty programs. So DSW, which is designed. Mm -hmm. shoe warehouse mm -hmm. and H&M if you return an item online uh, b mm. by mail there is a fee but if you're a member of the loyalty program oh. it's free so oh. it really pays to look at the fine print to see if you should sign up but again PBP pause before purchase. Like PBP you know what? up next tips to help you save on your energy bill this summer and later how to protect your online privacy and avoid pitfalls that's all ahead on consumer confidential
We're back with Consumer and Confidential. Summer is here, and that means higher energy bills are also on the way. The good news, there are simple ways to save big on your bills. Well, let's talk about some ways to maximize the efficiency. I mean, I was talking about some of these places in the country on the West Coast hitting the 90s. So yeah. the, when's the last time you checked your air conditioning unit it's, to see if it was clean, right unclogged, on. right? We just let that thing go and go. It needs to be inspected. It needs to be cleaned out. Now is the time before it gets really busy and the summer kicks in. The next thing is think about your thermostat. What do you have next to the thermostat? Is there a TV next to it, a lamp? That thing is giving out heat and it's triggering your thermostat to keep the AC uh, running longer. Uh. So make sure you move anything hot away from your thermostat. Huh. And then we talk about strategic planting. Think about your landscaping. If this is the time to put in some new trees and shrubs, what can you do to shade your air conditioning unit? Just make oh, sure the you're unit. Not, yeah, the unit okay. itself, right? You don't want um, a, a messy bush, though, sure. that's going to drop things onto it. And the other thing is think about the hottest part of your house, the, the part that faces the south and west. If you can plant some trees that will provide shade, that's going to cut down on your AC bill by 10%. Huh. At least. Really? Yeah. Landscaping. It's a huh? big difference, strategic landscaping. So let's go inside now. Let's yeah. talk about some ways, some tips to keep the inside of your house a little cooler for less. Fans are your friend. A yeah. fan uses 1 60th the amount of energy as an air conditioning unit. So use it in conjunction with your AC. And every degree that you can keep your AC above 75 degrees, you're saving another 15% on your electricity. You mean ceiling bill. fans? Ceiling fans or even floor fans. Oh, okay. Or table fans. Any kind of fan that can help move the air around. It's not going to cool the air, but it will draw the body heat away from your skin and make you feel cooler. Oh. The other thing that's very simple is to buy some caulking or weather stripping to seal any cracks yeah. that are in your walls. And then if you've got like gaps underneath your door or around your windows, get the weather stripping. It's yeah. a very inexpensive fix at the hardware store. Finally, if you can keep your blinds closed during the hottest parts of the day, you're going to reduce heat gain by 45%, 33% if you keep your drapes closed. So that's a simple one. If you want sunlight, go outside. That's These expensive. things add up. I mean, yeah. between the, you know, right. anyway. Exactly. Okay, I didn't realize this. A lot of electricity companies charge different rates for peak use hours. They really do, and it depends on where you live and the season. So you want to look that up on your energy company's website or give them a call. Generally, between two and six is when you want to avoid using your large appliances, your okay. dishwasher, your washer and dryer. Use it after 6 p.m. or on the weekends. The other thing we don't think about, unplug those little appliances, the chargers, everything that you have plugged in you that call you don't them vampire use. devices yes, they're slowly sucking the juice <laughs> out of the, the electricity system and causing your electric bill to go up those incandescent bulbs think about how many light bulbs you have in your yeah. house lamps in the ceiling switch everything to led not only does an led bulb last 25,000 hours compared to just 1200 hours for an incandescent bulb but those older bulbs they're just emitting heat yeah, they which are also hot. makes your house hotter yeah and they cost three times as much to run all okay, right bye. so switch to LED. i didn't realize this our water heaters yeah. in our homes are responsible for like a fifth of our bill yeah 18 percent of your mm -hmm. annual energy bill comes from your water heater. This is, I was going to ask you, Craig, from the last time, you remember I what remember degree you you're me. supposed to set yes, it at. And I didn't know then. <laughs> I've never and, even looked at it. But you ours. do now, 120 <laughs> degrees. I was going to say 120 degrees. Perfect, right on the money. You learned something from the last <laughs> segment. So the Consumer Product Safety Commission says not only is this safer, it's going to prevent anybody from being scalded by hot water, but it's more energy efficient. The other thing, only run a full load of laundry. I'm sure we know this by now. And use cold water unless you have really heavily soiled clothes. The last part is use the sun. At least start drying some of your clothes outside. And maybe if you don't like how crispy they get, mm -hmm. throw them in the dryer for the last five or ten minutes to fluff them back up. Okay. But use the sun. Use the outdoors to help you. All these things to help. So yeah. you know oh. with the credit cards, for example, yeah. you'll say, just call. Just ask for a discount. Apparently with this, maybe you could try that. Is that true? Always ask for a discount no matter where <laughs> and then you they hang up on you. situation. No, and this is the thing. Your energy provider has um, programs to help you with income. And that also is true. folks with disabilities yeah. can qualify for some of these programs. The other thing is a lot of companies want to encourage you to weatherize your home, install Energy Star appliances. We bought some uh, light bulbs through Con Ed, which is here in New York, mm -hmm. and the light bulbs were like 25 cents each. So there are programs that can save you up to $500 or more on your energy bill. Okay. Vicky wins. I know. Great tips. Save almost 30%. She, with she's like things. an encyclopedia. We'll take it. Thank you, Vicky. Thanks, Vic. Yep. Coming up, what you need to know to make it harder for advertisers to track you online, plus how to cut down on subscriptions and save more money. We're back right after this.
Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. Give up your email and get a discount. Well, it sounds simple, but did you know your email is a valuable key to unlocking a lot of personal information? Here's what you should consider before sharing that email. This is a common sight on most websites, pop-up windows asking you to enter your email address to get a discount. But it might not be worth it. Your email connects companies to a treasure trove of information that can stretch back decades. What you read, where you shop, your age, marital status, sexual orientation, medical history, income, even where you've traveled and lived, all pieces of information that come together to reveal your personal profile. I've had my email longer than I've had my phone number. And, and, and that's a reality for a lot of folks. Patrick Jackson is a cybersecurity expert with Disconnect, an online privacy company. Your email address is a lot more valuable than probably people think it is. It may contain your first and last name, your uh, birthday, who you work for, what school you go to. He says as Apple and Google add more ways for you to block apps from tracking you, and as more consumers say no to cookies, not those cookies, these cookies, advertisers and brands are now asking you directly for your email. It's something that consumers really don't, they don't understand that this is really the glue that connects all these pieces of information together. And when you open an email, that can give advertisers even more info about you. Jackson showed me how it works in real time. Okay, so I got an email that says shoe sale. Is that for me? Yep, that's for you. All right, I'm gonna open it. He hit a tracker in this banner advertisement, and the moment I open it, he learns a lot about me. Just from you opening this email, I can get um, your location, um, which is New York, New York. You're connecting from an iPhone. You're uh, using the Outlook app on your device, the time when you open it, and if you opened it again. Why should I care that you know all that about me? It's not clear that it's happening. It creates this, this beast that we no longer have control over once this data is collected. And where does all that data go? Patrick says it often ends up with so-called data brokers that might collect and sell it to people like Michael Prem, the CEO of Modern Impact, an advertising agency that helps brands target their customers. Prem says some of this data collection helps consumers by giving them a better online experience. What's the benefit to the consumer? The benefit to the consumer is actually receiving ads that enrich or create a better digital experience. There's no way to remove all advertising from our digital ecosystem. But Prem also advocates for consumer privacy and enforcement of privacy laws. The balance then for brands is making sure that they don't breach our privacy, where they don't come across as stalkerish. Do you think there's a world where you can have both? A consumer can protect their data and have their privacy and still have ads and an experience online that is relevant to them? I sure hope so. While it's not perfect, I think the the goal for many smart advertising brands are to continue to enrich that experience, not to hijack it. And it's not just your email, but your phone number too. That allows businesses to text you and target you for ads. And the more your phone number is out there, the greater a chance it could be part of a data breach, which would make you a bigger target for robocalls and spam texts. And just like mailing lists, it can also be hard to keep track of monthly subscriptions. Those can easily add up, but there are some simple steps you can take to trim down your expenses. We all have that list of subscriptions we're paying for from TV and music streaming to meal plans and fitness apps. HBO Max, and Netflix, and Hulu, Spotify, I think gym memberships. Charged automatically each month, whether we remember them or not. And as the Wall Street Journal recently reported, they add up. In a 2022 survey, respondents estimated they spent $86 a month on subscriptions. The actual average amount, $219. And it was far more for Lakeisha Mosley. The pandemic really put us all financially in a tizzy. And so I was going through trying to establish a budget. She found a plethora of forgotten subscriptions. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm paying for this and I'm paying for that including a recurring class pass membership that was costing her about $1,000 a year. I could count on one hand the time I signed in, maybe once or twice. Mosley added up over $700 a month in subscription charges. She ended up canceling more than half. Subscribers like her are saying enough is enough. Cancellations for Netflix, Hulu, HBO Max, and others rose about 50% in 2022 from the previous year. Are subscriptions one of those easy things to forget about because they're automatic? 
Absolutely. Your subscriptions are so often, they're small amounts. So sometimes we forget about them. $5, $6, $12 a month. And a proposed rule from the Federal Trade Commission would crack down on companies, ordering them to make it as easy to cancel as it was to sign up. They need to tell you how long the trial period goes for, clearly have to tell you by when you have to cancel. The FTC plan is now up for public comment. Meanwhile, there are a variety of apps that can help you keep track of expenses and flag subscriptions you may have forgotten. I realized I was paying for two Netflix accounts and two Spotify accounts. Dustin Hensley used the app Rocket Money to identify duplicate payments and a mystery $300 annual charge that he got refunded. What advice would you give to other consumers having gone through your experience? Pay attention. You get nickel and dime. It's death by a thousand cuts. If you don't want to use another app to track your subscriptions, you can streamline your payments so they are easier to track. For example, use your most used credit or debit card and set up alerts on your phone for when those charges hit. Then you'll see that. You'll be reminded that you are still paying for subscriptions. Still to come, staging your home can pay off getting it off the market quicker and at the price you're asking for or even more. Next, the tricks to make your house a hot property when consumed. Consumer Confidential returns. back. It is a tricky market for home buyers and sellers right now with high mortgage rates causing a dip in sales. But staging your home can make all the difference and the right changes can even get your home sold above asking price. The best part, you don't have to spend a fortune. All the world's a stage, including your home when it's time to sell. With existing home sales down nearly 23% from last year, some homeowners now opting to set the scene for potential buyers, giving their spaces a mini makeover before putting them on the market. We staged the main living areas. We also repainted a lot of walls, but more importantly, massively decluttered the house. From a fresh coat of paint and unobstructed windows to updated furniture and floor coverings, a recent survey finding 81% of buyer's agents said staging made it easier for a buyer to visualize a property as their future home. We sort of have to move the seller out a little bit in order to help the buyer feel like they can move in. Stacy Esser, a real estate agent in New Jersey who runs her own staging company, says most homes don't need a full renovation to attract buyers. Small changes can welcome a big return. Sellers spending an average of $400 to $600 on staging. You've seen it time and again that when you put in a little investment up front, that increases the sales price of the home? Yeah, you will actually sell your house for more money every single time. Esser says staged homes also sell faster. This listing under contract in one weekend for $126,000 above the asking price. And when the average home spent 160 days on the market in his neighborhood, the owner of this home, staged by Esser, says he accepted an offer in less than a month. What is today's buyer looking for? So today's buyer is looking for more flexible spaces, open floor plans, great storage, work at home, places they can work out, and more informal family time spaces. Esser says wherever the eye rests, the sale begins. You really want to help a buyer envision themselves in that space. 
The most important rooms to stage, the living room, the primary bedroom, and the kitchen. So this is a house coming on the market, actually, this weekend. Esser taking us on a tour of this home's dramatic before and after. One of the things that we start with is always to take any heavy window treatments off mm -hmm. and to really just let that sunshine in. This would-be formal living room recently painted a neutral color ahead of its transformation into a more casual, flexible space. Tell me what you did in here. So first of all, I think what we did is we just made the room feel a lot larger and created multiple seating areas in this really large space. What can you do in the kitchen to tidy it up and make it more appealing to buyers? So one of the easiest things we can do is basically help a seller declutter a kitchen. Esser's recipe for a market-ready kitchen, clear the counters, swap out bulky furniture, and accessorize with pops of color using items you already have in your fridge or pantry. You really jazzed up the kitchen. Yeah, we totally did. It's inexpensive and anybody could do this. These are actual just vegetables. And we like to use this cookbook to make it feel like somebody was just here cooking. And just switching out the table made a big difference. You combine the round table with the pop of white mm -hmm. and it really lightens up the space. And upstairs, Esser's team reverting this den back into a kid's bedroom. Bedrooms help sell houses. When it comes to staging, it's not just what's on the inside that counts. First impressions matter too. Don't forget about the outside. Make sure your home has curb appeal. There should be flowers planted outside. People should trim their hedges. People should make sure that their lawns are taken care of. Simple touches to help prepare your home for showtime. Esther says the best time to sell is when interest rates go down. She encourages you, if you are thinking about selling, to start your decluttering process now. For example, take down the family photos like this. See how much cleaner and clearer it looks? Next, you're gonna wanna remove any drapes to allow some more natural light to shine into those windows. It makes a big difference. And if you have a busy wallpaper, you wanna change that to a neutral color, maybe paint it to liven up and clear out your home. This is all gonna help interested buyers imagine themselves living in your space. That's our time for now. Thanks so much for watching. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William France Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Dookie Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eater is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Dookie Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Dookie Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po'boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. 
African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Ducky Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china, she wanted linens, she wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution, years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. Well, there were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades. From red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dookie. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. 
gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter Four. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, hey, yes. Enjoying everything. It's it's great to everything. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Dookie Chase to, to get, get myself some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. 
Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzie Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken. Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. It's so, so good, good to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been way too long. I missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York 
when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's had. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you and the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, Sylvia used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So, did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applies a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh-huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gently he's putting it in there? Putting the baby to bed. Yep, they'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. I, I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to. I'm gonna try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow, that looks perfect. Now, this now is you're worth, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're going person. for. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning, it's moist, crisp. Oh, your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I can come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and um, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized, but in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come to the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. And a good Wednesday morning to you. All eyes on Hunter Biden this morning. Yeah, the president's son heading to a Delaware courtroom. It is July the 26th. This is today. In the spotlight, Hunter Biden is set to plead guilty to federal tax crimes, part of his controversial plea deal with federal...